we started um i can start can we start or no yeah yes okay welcome to day 2 of the first ever college pond virtual mentorship symposium we had an extremely informative session yesterday and all on and all set to continue the pace today the mentorship symposium uh, brings you 35 plus trailblazers who have succeeded in scripting their thriving collegiate and global career trajectory and sanjay is one of them joining us right now okay across the span of the four day event our mentors will walk you through every aspect of converting your academic and career dreams into your success story we'll be having five sessions today half an hour each where mentors will give a brief introduction of their profile following which the mentor will post some big a uh, following which mentors will may give a presentation about the field that they actually working in uh the first the first session is going to be focused on quantum computing 101 the future of computing era uh, and it's going to be uh, provided by uh, uh, it's going to be spearheaded by sanjay vishwakarma by way of background sanjay finished his ms in ece from carnegie mellon university where he was positioned as a graduate research assistant uh while studying he acquired a quantum research internship at ibm which he later converted to a full time job and now is positioned as a research software engineer at ibm sanjay welcome on board and we would love definitely love to hear from you about quantum computing because i know it's an upcoming field and something that is of uh, great interest to everybody here yeah so thank you shuras for the introduction like um, i'll begin my presentation so let's go so uh hi i'm sanjay i'm a research software engineer at ibm i'm uh, also a kisker advocate and a, and a quantum ambassador today we are all uh, gathered here to have a, like a quantum one hour session so let's begin let's begin like why do we we need quantum computing we have like a super powerful classical systems like super computers and everything then why do we need quantum computing so let's begin with a simple question how many ways can i arrange a dinner party of 10 people so probably the answer will be 10 factorial and it will be like 10 into 9 into 7 into 6 and all everything and it will be like 36 lakhs 28000 and 800 ways this uh, this looks like a simple problem but what, what if i uh, keep adding chairs in this problem it will be 11 factorial 12 factorial 13 factorial and the soon the problem will grow exponentially and it will become difficult for the classical computers to come up with a solution so some problems are bigger than you think we think that a problem is big but a problem is even bigger than we think but uh, don't we already have a, like uh, powerful computers that can easily handle big problems will be saying yeah probably we have like super powerful computers this is ibm summit super uh, computer it have like this many amounts of bits of storage but still which is not enough to perfectly model a caffen now what exactly is caffen so caffen has 24 atoms in it but modeling it requires a lot of power using a classical computer perfectly modeling a ca uh, caffen will take about 10 to 48 bits of storage and 10 to 48 bits is a lot amount of bit the number of atoms on the entire planet is about 10 to 49 so clearly we can see there is a huge problem that we need to address so some problems are too small to see clearly as well so big and small this duality of big and small is exactly where quantum computing lives classical computers follows the classical law of physics simple but the computer uh, quantum computer follows this uh, the law of quantum mechanics quantum mechanics is like how things really behave on a small scale which is very weird that we'll be talking about in the future slides because of this quantum computer can tackle really big problems much efficiently than how classical computers can now let's look at a, at a different way we see like uh, how uh, uh, simulating a classical um, caffen model is much more difficult now let's look at another lay, another way how quantum computer can help in this field as well so what is the current trend and situation in industry we know that the machine learning and deep learning and training times double every 3.4 months whereas the classical ca computer hardware doubles after 24 months which is 7x uh, slower and this is like every 24 months is also called as moore's law and in industry it's like uh, it's a debatable topic that the moore's law is dead that we are not able to double the transistors uh, transistors every 24 months we have reached the limit of like um, smaller transistor that we can fit into a chip so this is like 7x slower then how we can address this there are two possible solution to address this demand it's like if the training time is taking 2 uh, hours and it was it was using two gpus and if the training time has been increased to 4 hours we, we probably have to buy more gpus like four gpus to train the machine learning models 
or the second solution will be to look for a different powerful architecture and quantum computers seems to be a possible architecture for the machine learning and deep learning training let's look at the second part data generation we know that deep learning concept has been in the has been in the industry for a long time it's decades and decades ago but it came into availability because of data today we generate 2.5 billions of data and the question arises like how will we processing this so much amount of data with the current architecture we are just on the edge of uh, the current architecture again quantum computer seems to be a possible solution for processing this much amount of data and provide a useful insight to everyone now why do even quantum computing matters even even the quantum computers are uh, currently limited in certain ways today the potential remains gigantic to creating a new paradigm in which how we solve quantum computer so what quantum computer does actually provide to us it provides new algorithms it provides new approach to the problems that is very difficult for the classical computers to come up with and new technological breakthroughs so now let's talk about uh, actual quantum computers like what is bits and what are the properties of qubits so uh, what is qubit and why it is special so a qubit the name comes from a description of quantum bit of data we know right in uh, in classical computers we have bit and bits can be 0 and 1 right and the bit is a piece of information that we use similarly we have a uh, uh, we have a term in quantum computer which is called qubit so qubit is like a quantum bit of data like how we have classical bit of data we have quantum bit of data and rather than calling it a bit we call it as qubit so qubit has special properties that we'll be exploring next so there are few different ways to physically make a qubit like how we make a bit in classical computers we have like certain different techniques that we'll be building of uh, quantum bits so it's similar to a bridge like how they can be constructed differently with varying strength and weaknesses but all same all serve the same purpose so let's talk about the first property of the qubit that we'll be looking into so imagine you have like uh, three coins and in the world of classical physics each one will be in one of the state like if i have a coin it will be either head it will be either head or tail or it will be like if i have three coin it will be in one of the three possible combination it can be head head tail or head 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 or all head into tail everything like eight combinations right we have three coins but in the world of quantum computer each coin can be at the same time into head and tail as well so one qubit have three possible states it can be in head also it can be in tail also or it can be in the head and tail at the same time and this the property of having like a qubit in head and tail is it's called superposition so if we if i have three qubits i can be in all unique combination at the same time now let's explore it more let's explain the power of what i mean in classical computers to look at all the three states like head head tail or all the possible combination that i uh, saw you in the earlier state i need to run my program eight times to see all the eight possible all possible combination of the coin but in quantum computing i need to run my program only once to see all the states that and thanks to quantum uh, thanks to superposition for n qubits we we have two raised to n state so this is a real um, exponential speed up computing power that we get with the quantum computing due to the superposition this is a superposition uh, animation that will be understanding so a coin will be rotating so it can be in a head and tail both at the same time it just spins it's just not a definite state that a classical computers give like head and tail it can be a qubit can be in head tail or it can be at a superposition of both head and tail so the coin will be uh, just spinning out and you will be getting head and tail both as the output of one qubit so let's talk about the another property that is very important uh, that's all the fundamentals of quantum computing its entanglement so there's one coin which says that i am head but remember how we said like quantum mechanics can be weird this is one of the weirdest thing it is hard to describe like what's going on in the entanglement but uh, let's try to make it understand so even einstein was surprised and he uh, called this spooky action the resistance so especially we have two qubits that are entangled and become correlated to each other so if i have one qubit and two qubit it becomes correlated if we correlated and even if we separate them like even if i keep one qubit in uh, india and if if i keep one qubit in the us if i know some some information about the india qubit will be having some information about the us qubit so when you observe one you learn something about the other no matter how far it is so the another cube another qubit also said me too so if i entangle two qubit if i measure one qubit if i know some information about one qubit i'll be knowing something about the another qubit this is an entanglement that we use in quantum computer and it is very difficult concept to understand so this is another um, representation to see entanglement so if i know something about the first coin i'll be knowing about the other coin so it's head head and tail tail so these two core these two qubits are correlated and will be getting something about the other qubit so 
uh, everyone knows like in classical computers we have like um, gates like AND gate, NOR gate, NAND gates, and everything that form the basis of the uh, classical uh, systems. We built out circuits, right, in classical systems. Similarly, we build circuits in quantum computers as well. So these are some of the basic uh, quantum gates that we have. Like in classical computers, also we have gates. In uh, quantum computer, also we have gates. So one of them is like poly X gate, which flips the qubit from zero to one, or vice versa. So in classical uh, terms, you will be calling this gates as a NOT gate. So this is similar to NOT gate, but we call it as a poly X gate. There's one more, uh, there's one more gate called Hadamard gate. So this gate is basically puts the state of a qubit into superposition. So initially all the qubits are in the zero state. So if I put a gate Hadamard gate in front of a zero qubit, it will be, it will put the qubit into zero and one of superposition. So it will be one or zero, zero, one. It puts into superposition. Similarly, we have control not gate. It flips the second qubit only in the first qubit, uh, even if the first qubit is one. So if the first qubit is zero, the second qubit will also be zero. It doesn't have any effect on the second qubit, but if for the first qubit is one, it will put, it will flip the second qubit and it will be one. So these are some of the gates that we have in quantum, in, in quantum computing. So in quantum computer as well, we built out circuit, but the gates are different and it has some different properties of the gates that we need to understand. So quantum computer uses a special bit of data, which we call as a qubit, which follows the law of quantum mechanics. We use this law to our advantage, enabling us to put uh, qubits into superposition or to create entanglement. So using all the techniques that I said in the, in the previous slides, we can estimate that a quantum computer would require only 160 qubits to model caffeine, which is much more manageable than 10 to 49. So in 160 qubit, I'll be easily able to manage the uh, caffeine molecule. And it is pretty much easier and it's like much faster as well than ca classical computer. Okay. So let's look at like how actually a quantum computer look like. So it's a channel. The quantum computer at IBM looks like a big channel full of cables for, for sending data and maintaining the environment. The way at the bottom, like you can see at the bottom, there is like a quantum processor chip and it's uh, exactly about the size of stem. So if you have, if you would have uh, uh, seen a stem from the postcard, the quantum computer chip is at right at the bottom and it is of same size. So, this is a processing chip. If you zoom in the processing chip at the I of IBM, it looks like this. The dark blue uh, squares are the qubits, are uh, quantum points. And the swiggy lines are like microwave resonator, which is how our uh, coins talk to each other and the computer is sending its instruction. To work properly, it needs to be very cold. It should be colder than outer space. So quantum computer actually requires a lot of uh, low temperature and it's like 0 0.01 degrees Kelvin. This is, uh, this is like, uh, too much like we need to keep it very cold to function it properly because qubits are very fragile like um, it, it is very error prone so we need to keep it very cold and everything so this you can see on the left hand side there's a chamber this is a dilution chamber that we use to keep uh, the quantum computer very cool so even if you visit some of this like quantum computer you will be listening a lot of sound because i think it's because of this dilution chamber and on the left hand side there is one um one of our ibm researcher He's just working on quantum computer. This is the actual quantum computer and this actual setup is placed into this dilution chamber to make it cool. So one of the question, like many people have, like you, like you will be since uh, you since said, like it will require a lot of temp a lot of uh, temperature and everything, then how we will be able to access a quantum computer from our home. So today, because of the, I don't know, cloud computing and a lot of internet service, we at we are now able to access quantum computer right from our home. So we'll be able to access quantum computer right from our from our using a classical system. So this is a, a general representation. So this is a classical system and we uh, make our circuit and we send this circuit to our IBM, IBM cloud, IBM cloud. What it does, it uh, converts the circuit into pulses and these pulses are then sent to the quantum computer. The quantum computer, it's then given to the chips. It executes the circuit that you have given and it converts back to the pulses. These pulses are returned back to the, uh, to, to the IBM cloud where we convert these pulses into a classical system measurement. So right, it's readable by the classical system. This is the output that we are representing from the pulse to a classical output. So we can access right now quantum computer at our home from our using classical system via cloud. So it's, it's, it's now very accessible to everyone. Like because of cloud, everyone can access quantum computer right now from using their own classical systems. So. Let's talk about like uh, what will be the different futures of quantum computing. What are like there are n number of n number of things where we are using uh, using uh, quantum computing. I'll be listing out some of them. Finance. We have like a huge uh, application in finance industry. We know that there's a lot of financial product that we use. Like there is stock, there is a uh, risk department, there is fraud department. 
so whenever there is a risk department for department there is a lot of optimization there is a lot of things that are that the factor that we consider like stocks are there how the stocks prediction how it will go there's a lot of thing that we calculate so calculating a portfolio takes a lot of time in uh, finance industry and day by day day by day it's becoming complicated like there's so much things that are going on the humans are doing and there's so much things ups and downs that we need to consider time factors and a lot of things about the stock it's becoming very complicated to come up with the optimization and of the play of portfolio so quantum computer has one of the huge application in finance it will be helping in uh, portfolio optimization second is like search if uh, if in a database or something i have like 10 uh, 10 numbers and i want to figure as like uh, 1 to 10 and i want to search for a number 10 and if the number is at the bottom of the my array it will take off and uh, run time right in the classical system but in quantum computer we have an algorithm which is called rover algorithm which is used to search uh, for an uh, something in an in an array or something so right from uh, using this Glover's algorithm, O of n is the runtime that we get from classical system, but using Glover's algorithm, we can get O raised to square root of n. It's a quantum speed up that we get because of search. So it has one of the um, application in searching for random errors. Second is like chemistry molecule. Chemistry. In chemistry, just I told, like if I want to um, stimulate or molecule, a model, a caffeine model, I need a lot of bits. I need to have a lot of time to simulate, but using quantum computer, I'll be able to do it with a, a few number of qubits and which is more manageable. So in chemistry also to find out new chemicals, to find out different proportions and everything we have, like we need to, we need to like stimulate so much things of chemical, like it's very difficult for the classical computers to do it. So there we have like quantum computers to help them. And it's like in single intake, we can stimulate a lot of chemical models and get to the output. Third is like a machine learning. We know, right. There's a lot of machine learning hype going on. Like it's, um, it's one of the ho hottest topic right now, but since the training time and everything is going increasing, like how we'll be able to use it. So there's a quantum machine learning QML, which is called in which we run like quantum machine learning algorithms on quantum computers and able to provide the result to them. So we have a huge scope in machine learning as well. We have encryption. We know that RSA algorithm uh, is based on uh, factorization. So in quantum computer, we have a showers algorithm. The showers algorithm is able to get the factorization of a large number within a seconds, like within a very in one shot. So in like period finding, there's a period finding term in encryption. So in encryption, we are able to use source algorithm and get to, uh, uh, get to a huge outcome. So there's a huge scope in encryption as well. And there's a lot of whole story going on that uh, quantum computer will be able to break the RSA security. That's a different topic, but still we are not here till that point, but it's still going on. So it will be helping in encryption as well. And there's a quantum tunneling as well, like uh, how a wavelength can be um, can pass to an object. So there's a quantum uh, annealing and uh, tunneling where we are optimizing this. So these are some of the applications. There are more applications that uh, industries are using right now to come up with the solution. Second, uh, I want to uh, conclude this session by saying that anybody can learn quantum computing. So it's not like uh, quantum computing will be uh, learned by a physician or a mathematician. You don't have to be physician or mathematician for learning quantum computing. You have to be like a great mathematician, physics or anything. No, you won't be able to do that. Quantum computing is like, uh, we are in a very early stage of quantum computing and we need uh, people from different background to come up with a community so that we can, uh, we'll be able to bring, uh, tackle the huge problems that we have in a quantum computing, like a physics will be knowing about the quantum computing, but uh, to come up with a, uh, quantum application, like, uh, if I'm a chemist, I'll be knowing that, that this is the problem that I am facing. And if I learn quantum computing, I'll be, able, I'll be able to correlate, like how this problem I can solve using quantum computing. So it's like anybody can learn quantum computing right now. It's like accessible to everyone. And it's like, uh, there is a lot of resources out there and it doesn't require that much efforts. Like you don't have to be physics or like, you know, you know, about all the spooky action that Taylor and Taylor were doing and split actions and everything. No, you can learn quantum computing. Anybody can learn quantum computing. So thank you. I want to conclude the session by saying uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Sanjay. But there's a lot of questions. Sanjay, you've done a phenomenal job. I didn't know understand the potential of quantum computing uh, yeah. till now. But there are a few questions that came up. Uh, the first question is, what are the opportunities of quantum computing? I know IBM is one uh, significant player that focuses on quantum computing. But as you look at quantum computing as a career choice for a lot of people, um, mm -hmm. where do you see quantum computing going? Is it going to replace classical computing? Do you see in the next five years that a lot more people are going to get involved in quantum? Is it going to be the next trend? Or what is, what do you, where do you see quantum computing going? 
So as I mentioned, like uh, quantum computing, we are in a very early stage. Like there are certain limitations that we have like currently with uh, quantum computing. And one of the myth that is going on in the uh, entire industry is like uh, quantum computing will be replacing classical systems, but uh, it's uh, never going to happen like uh, in the entire career, like uh, quantum computer will never be able to replace classical systems. Because quantum computers are like super, um, like special purpose co computers. If I use a quantum computer for multiplying two numbers, right? It will like uh, perform worse than a classical computer. So quantum computers are like special computers that are defined for do doing some special purpose. Classical will be using classical computers as well for the quantum computer, but quantum computer do will never see, be- Do you, see, do you yeah. see quantum computing taking, especially where they have data centric, everything is moving towards data and the uh, amount of number crunching or data crunching that's going on right now. Do you mm -hmm. believe that uh, quantum computing will become more and more pronounced as a, uh, a, a significant uh, technology to reckon with in the yeah. years to come? Yeah, hundred percent. Like quantum computer will be coming up with the applications. Like there will be use of application like in chemistry and everything but it won't be replacing classical systems. So in coming years, we'll be having a, uh, like we have like a lot of roadmaps of IBM, like we'll be having some application at come IBM will like the quantum computer will be commercially available to the industries. So there are certain applications where quantum computer will be used where classical computers, we are not able to come up with. So for uh, simple, simple taxes, we won't be using quantum computers for uh, like just multiplying two numbers or like video streaming and everything for that purpose, we won't be using quantum computer, but for processing huge amount of data, like where classical systems uh, cannot perform, there there will be the application of quantum computer. And in coming years, we might have like some commercial applications of quantum computer. Great, great. Okay, another question that came up is, could you explain few examples of quantum entanglement and superposition states in real life examples? Yeah, so for understanding the real life example of this uh, superposition and entanglement, we have like different algorithms. You need to go through the algorithms and how we are able to like, there are certain inputs that we are able to use in the algorithm. Like, uh, as I mentioned, there are like, so Grover's algorithm, which is used to find the, uh, the unknown term in the, uh, in the search arrays and everything. We have Grover's algorithm for factorization. So there are certain algorithms that we'll be using out for uh, the superposition entanglement. And due to the time constraint, like uh, if I, I would have uh, shown a real example, like how we are stimulating a circuit in a quantum computer. So I would highly recommend to go to the algorithm and it's like, it's just, how um, there is a in set of input that we give to a gates and gates perform the spinning actions and everything and superposition entanglement. So we have like real uh, example as well, like how you'll be finding uh, factorization of a number and how in a, in a set of uh, unknown data, unknown uh, elements, how we are able to find an element. So there are algorithms that um, make the real life example of uh, entanglement and superposition. Okay. A question for you from a career perspective, how many opportunities are there in uh, quantum computing? Do a lot of companies right now spending resources, investing resources in quantum computing? Yeah. So according to my perspective, like there are many industries that are heavily investing in quantum computing right now. So it's like some of the companies are just uh, putting on the research, on the research side of quantum computing. Like um, there is some, uh, if I'm an industry of some, something, like X application, I'll be putting out some of my funds to the for research team to come up with how my application will be enhanced by quantum computer. And it's like, um, we don't want, you know, we, uh, many industries don't want like to wait till the end, like when quantum computer will be mature and their competitors will be ahead of them. So they wanted to get started earlier. So many companies are heavily investing in quantum computing right now. And they are coming up with their application, how my application will be enhanced by the quantum computer. So, so do you see, do you see there's a, there was supply demand in terms of a human resource perspective, uh, there's a significant demand available. Yeah. According to me, there are significant demands available. And right now the pace that quantum computing is going on, I'm seeing a lot of people coming up with the community and everything. And we have like, I have seen like a lot of, um, hackathons and everything, and like there's enthusiasm going in the people and the industry as well. So we have like equal opportunities. If you go to uh, any uh, career page of company, there is a quantum computing position available, I think. So there is a demand for quantum computing as well and for people as well. And as so I there are plenty like, of jobs and internships in this area, I take it. Yeah, there are jobs available. And it's not like that if the quantum computing job is available that you'll be working on quantum computer like applications or hardware parts, something. We need software people as well. As just, I just mentioned like there are people that uh, we make uh, quantum computer accessible by cloud. How will we be making it accessible with the cloud? We need to have software developers as well in this field. 
so we have like we need people from different part diverse background like i said um, a physics said like won't know like what what is the pain point of a chemistry people what is it so we need chemistry also we need people from all the backgrounds right. to join quantum computing we don't want just physics to join quantum computing we're in a very early stage we need people from all the community okay i uh, just yeah. quick a couple more technical questions how are qubits represent traditional computers would they lose information because qubits are more of a quantum computing concept so how do they get converted into uh traditional bits so it's like um it's like a qubit is there if a qubit is in zero state we make it like use hadamard gate and make it in a zero one so it's just like the probability that we measure it's like uh how we measure a class how we measure a qubit Uh, how we measure a bit? If we measure a qubit, if there is a one bit, and if I measure it, can be zero or one right now, right? If I execute a circuit of just a NOT gate, if I put zero, it will be like if I the NOT gate is there, it will be one, right? How we measure? Like it's similar to classical computer. How we measure, but qubits perform different. Like it follows a uh, quantum mechanics, and it's like if we put it on us, uh, they are like separately prepared, like a bridge architecture or something, and it will be like when we measure them, it will be having zero and one. So there is a probability measurement that we do, and It's just like how we measure things. We'll be doing. It's it's just a qubit is like differently made and a and a qubit is differently made, and it we make it like uh, superposition and everything. Then we uh, get to know about our different measurement sticks. Great. Just yeah. uh, I'm not going to ask any more tech. Uh, student, uh, this is the student fraternity. If I'm not asking you a question, uh, you can post it to info at collegepond dot com. And uh, we will answer. We'll uh, assimilate all the questions and uh, then send it out to Sanjay to answer them. Uh, yeah. Sanjay, a big question, and everyone is. I and this question that Ivan I had is: How do you start a career in quantum computing? What did you do to get into quantum computing? We've got three minutes, so I just want you to give me the, yeah. this answer. What? Yeah. How did? Why did you get excited about quantum computing? I think it's extremely exciting field. But what got you to that field? And how does one? Start a career in this field. So, um, according to me, like I, I was, I guess, in my first semester, and um, there was like uh, I was uh, learning modern computer architecture there, and I was just looking into different architecture, like how GPUs are there, CPUs are there, and how how we are reaching the limit, and how we need some new architecture or something. So it was like uh, exciting for me, like how current GPUs are able, to, like there was a lot of memory architecture, cache cache architecture, and a lot of things going on in the hardware. And soon then I came up uh, with the Like there was a limitation that was hitting, so there was a need for new architecture, and I was just uh, learning things and all. And then suddenly, like I came across like a quantum intern, quantum research internship at IBM. So I just started to learn uh, research about quantum computing, like what exactly is quantum computer. Let's look at it and all. And as soon as I go go into reading it, reading it, reading it, I, I find it very interesting, like the uh, superposition thing, the entanglement thing, and the computing power. It provides an exponential computing power. So it was like modern computer architecture as well. I was learning, and as a cyber side, I got to know about a new architecture of quantum computing. So as I got into like reading, reading, I got into more exciting into it, and I, I and I tried for getting a quantum research internship with IBM. So I got into the internship, and I got to learn a lot of things. Then, and I joined internship, and I think I guess while internship, I become a Kiske advocate as well. Like I was uh, contributing to the community as well and learning a lot of things. So while during IBM as well, I I did like. Uh, Quantum internships and everything, and then I converted a full time. It just like it came into my path, and I just uh, get into more excited, and uh, I started digging into. Were more there into were there curriculum subjects in uh, quantum computing in your at CMU, or was no. it something that you picked up on your own? I picked them on my own. It was on all on my own, and there is like IBM has like a lot of free resources available on the internet. Like there is a Kiske textbook as well. I can link uh, send a link of it. Like it's a textbook that is freely provided by IBM. to get started with quantum computing can you can you share that link if you don't mind yeah i can share that link just give me one minute so it's like a free textbook it will have like prerequisites and everything like you don't have to be uh, like you don't have to go much anywhere here and there there is a, a prerequisite for maths as well so i'm just sharing the link Yeah. So this is the textbook. Like this textbook have like a uh, uh, math prerequisite, Python prerequisite, and it has like a lot of information about qubits. It has a lot of algorithms that I talk about today. Great, great, Sanjay. Yeah. I want to thank you for being part of this. Uh, yeah. I think more than anything, it was highly informative. I think quantum computing. While we talked about machine learning and AI a few years ago, I think quantum computing is something that's to to be reckoned with in the years to come. and i yeah. think you're definitely positioned in the right field 
to go move yeah. ahead as you look at the competing uh, the para the competing paradigm as you go yeah. again thank you for all the insights that you provided uh the next speaker that we're going to have is going to be talking about software engineering something back to ground level reality <laughs> yeah. uh, sanjay sanjay i know it is early in the morning for you but that's great for joining us i know it's 5:30 and you mentioned that thank you for waking up for yeah. us right it's a, it's a, uh, yeah. students it's a, if you have any if you have any questions uh, for sanjay directly you can post it to directly at info@collegefund.com and we'll be more than happy to get the questions together and then send it out to sanjay uh so we will go through we've got vritti coming in okay uh joining in uh sanjay we're going to move to software engineering right now if you want to stick around you're more than welcome to yeah no issues okay vritti how are you today good morning Hi Suraj, good morning. I'm doing good. Thank you. Are you in okay. California as well? Um, I'm actually traveling. I'm in Montana right now. Okay, so you're still in a time zone that's early in the morning for you. Thank you for taking the time early in the morning, like I say, San- to Sanjay as well, to be part of this. Okay. Of course. So Riti, Riti is going to talk to us about nuts and bolts of software engineering today. Okay. Ah, uh, let me give some background about Riti. Ah, uh, Riti, you want to introduce yourself, or should I give a background about you? Sure, I can go. Um, okay, go so, ahead, Riti. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Riti Rohira, and um, I currently work as a software engineer at Microsoft. Um, it's been about two years since I joined Microsoft. Uh, I joined Microsoft straight out of uh, my grad school. I did my grad at uh, USC. I did a master's in computer science, um, and I previously was studying in Mumbai, where I went to Suraj um, in College Pond, basically for getting into USC. Um, and i was actually very close to the office i studied at bjti um, so yeah so briefly how was your experience at uh, usc but more importantly microsoft i think people are more concerned about microsoft today okay. how well, do you USC get into microsoft great. company like microsoft what is software engineering because you know software engineering is something that people talk about in general terms mm-hmm. i know when i was talking to you when you think you were going to grad school okay we talked about software engineering so what is software engineering like when actually it in real t- from a real time perspective so to be completely honest theoretical software engineering has been completely different from what you actually do at big companies um, um so in academia you will learn about stuff like algorithms sorry let me just ask you is there too much background noise or am i audible out okay. here there is little bit background noise on your side i think you yeah, but that's fine i think we can hear okay. you let me know if it gets too much i'll try to move my location okay that's fine go ahead Okay. Um, so um, in school, you do learn about uh, you know stuff like algorithms, how to optimize your code, and all. Okay, I'll tell you to switch location. Okay, cool. Let me just give me a minute. I apologize. No worries. while uh, riti is just changing her location if you have any questions you can post it in the chat box or the q and a box we'll be more than happy to answer your questions and post it. hello okay go ahead riti sorry continue uh, better classical versus practical uh, yeah uh, so academia i feel is important to know because it shows you like it is about the basics and you know the fundamentals that you need to apply but when you go into the real world it's more about system design looking at things from the bigger perspective as well as going to you know like smaller details on how you can write better code uh, in and performance you know to optimize performance as well as memory constraints algorithms do teach you some of that um, but i think a lot of the learning actually happens on the job um so a combination of both is really necessary um and to come back to the earlier question that you asked you know how do you get into companies like um, microsoft um so for me studying at usc like there were multiple avenues where you apply to companies like this uh, so starting on the ground it was like career fairs um where companies come and talk to you uh, i'm not sure how much of this has already been spoken about so please stop no 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 there hasn't there is uh... 
Riti, we had a great session on quantum computing before this. Okay, cool. <laughs> so, I just want to I'll make even, sure I'm not giving repetitive no, no, yeah, I'll tell you. I'll tell you if, we are, if we're going through it. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, um, when you're on the ground, you're in college, uh, the first avenue is career affairs. Um, that's where companies come to you know, your campus uh, and they're actively recruiting. Um, so you go talk to the recruiters, you know, they'll probably ask you a few questions about your background. Uh, you tell them. And uh, the other uh, thing in college is uh, the career center itself. Uh, and a lot of schools have like these internal portals um, where they host jobs. Um, you know, and those jobs are specifically tailored for your school. Uh, they also host like information sessions, which are not necessarily in the career affairs. Um, so you should definitely make sure that you go to those and, you know, like get your resume in like to the recruiters. Um, and that's when they call you back if they like your profile. Uh, the other thing that people do a lot is um, cold emailing or cold messaging people on LinkedIn. Um, so a lot of time, like hiring managers have on their profile that, uh, you know, we're hiring for this, this, this team. Uh, so you should definitely reach out to them. Uh, I know the chances for that are probably one out of 10, you know, if you're getting a response. Uh, but I think you just got to keep going at it. Um, and people do respond. Like people here are really nice. Um, yeah, so those are- What inspired you to get into software engineering? You know, there's so many choices available in the computer science field. There's cloud, there's various things. What inspired you to get into software engineering? Um, so I was always a math person um, and, you know, going into the logic of computer engineering and, you know, like how things work, like it's very logical, like the math was logical. And I felt like computer science was logical as uh, like had the same kind of application of logic. Um, so that was one of the things. Um, also, I think working for big tech was one of the things that really aspired me, um, the impact that they have. Um, and yeah. Okay. What languages today, you know, students are looking at the future of software engineering and what they should be doing. How do they get prepped up to get into the field? What languages would you actually recommend someone to actually pick up? How important is data structures, algorithms, and all these courses that you took? What is the most valuable course you took at the USC or in your undergrad program that really helped you to where you are from a recruiting perspective, A, and from a real-time work perspective? Got it. Okay. Um... So to start with the basic courses that I would definitely recommend or, you know, having knowledge of not forget courses, you can get this information however you want, uh, would definitely be data structures and algorithms. Like those are the core essential uh, requirements that you need to know uh, because that's how you will eventually, you know, go and write code in, in, in wherever you are writing code. Uh, that is one thing. And then the other thing is any database system course, you know, like, uh, because eventually you interact with any data source in real life. Uh, so just to get that a sense of uh, how the interaction happens and, you know, like just the basic understanding of how systems work together. Uh, the other big thing right now is distributed systems, you know, like um, most of the companies use distributed systems and solve like problems with using that. Um, so having a good understanding of that, I think is also a plus. Uh, in terms of languages, I don't specifically recommend any particular language because what I have been told from my seniors and mentors as well is that uh, you need to have an understanding of uh, programming uh, fundamentals and not just the language because the language just adds the decoration and the syntax to it. Uh, but as long as you can code in one specific language and have an understanding of that, uh, let's say for an example, like for an object-oriented programming language, right? If you write in Java, C++, it doesn't really matter. Uh, as long as you know the fundamentals of that. Uh, so yeah, and then, uh, sorry, can you repeat the second part of the question that you had? I don't remember the question now in terms of that, but I think those are the two questions. What is your typical day like? as a software engineer, Microsoft and big tech? Um, so my day usually, so luckily in tech here, um, you can have the flexibility to start whenever you want and work from home at that very obvious. Like I have teammates starting at 11, I have teammates starting at seven. Um, so you start your day and then uh, you start your day, you check, I check my email, um, I check my messages. If I have anything important, do I need to prioritize? If not, I start with my work. Um, and if there's something important to me, I need to help out with, I go jump into that. Um, so we have uh, weekly scrums, uh, weekly rather thrice a week, we have scrums. Scrum is nothing but like a, a team meeting where we discuss our status updates, um, how we are tracking for the sprint. Um, 
and uh, yeah so after that uh, then if regular business of meetings uh, regular uh, meetings if there are any scheduled from before or even on the day you know like if there's an incident that comes up uh, we need to jam our bridge to like solve it um, and uh, yeah just the regular task for the sprint our work is cut down into sprints um, so for my team it's just like three weeks of coding and one week of planning um, and in the three weeks of course we like do the task that we have committed to um, yeah and and uh, so the, the whole process is the the sprints is or the entire focus so at the time of release you're really working a lot more to make sure the bugs all wiped out um so it's more continuous development continuous integration continuous development um we do have bugs so we have a lot of alerting telemetry that is set up for our services um and we do get bugs in like every, not every day but like whenever we get bugs we try to prioritize based on the current work and we fix them as is uh we release every month uh, it's not a big gap um so we test as we code which i think is very important um and that's one of the solid principles that is there in software engineering when you test um, when you say test as we code meaning that you have the qa testing or do you guys test it yourself uh no we test it ourselves so um at least my team we um make sure we have unit tests integration tests you know end to end tests uh, so every time like a sprint completes we also conduct an internal bug bash uh, so we so we have like different test environments um so first is like the developer test environment then there's like test environment 2 which is where we deploy our code before it actually goes to like production uh, or to the world you know and uh, once that payload like the sprint payload is ready we internally test it again um like using like people go and try out different things and this is just the dev team we don't have like a separate qa team um yeah so testing happens all along the way uh, by us okay okay and the question for you how important when you got into microsoft was, did you have any prior experience before joining microsoft or were you directly from vgti and you applied straight yeah, to so, grad school yeah i did not have any experience i had like two internships before i went to usc and then i interned um, at expedia uh, when i was studying at usc and then i straight got into microsoft after that okay okay so the key is that you don't need experience to get into one of these big uh, big companies no i don't think so did you yeah. did you do you believe that the rest of your star rest of your peers had experience they were in an advantage position or not really um not much of a difference i would say um like obviously they do prefer some other experience but they equally value people who don't have experience uh because their perspective is different right like and uh, like companies need different perspectives like to operate like you know in a global kind of setting um so yeah so what is the job situation like i mean what what how did how did you actually secure the job as a software engineer at microsoft the question came up is how do i get an interview at fang i would say okay. fang plus m so mm-hmm. how do you do that um so what worked for me was um i had a friend in the team that i currently work on um and they had a new opening that was coming up for a new team um so they are like internally you get asked you know like do you have people you know you can refer for to this job and those are the most direct ways to get into any of the companies uh cuz to be honest like companies like fang uh like they really big they get like lakhs of emails and you know applications every day um so having that one person in who will refer you directly or you know like even getting a referral into the system is important um that's how basically i got my job uh, so my very so directly to the hand so what you're saying is networking is key to get into a fang plus m yes definitely definitely okay okay now let me ask you what do you see uh, from as the seniors that you've seen what's a career progression for you career progression for me um uh, okay so um, at microsoft typically let me explain how the career structure works and then how i have navigated it so far uh so at microsoft we have software engineer software engineer 2 software engineer 3 and there are like multiple bands within that uh so, so for example like software engineer 1 has like two levels within that uh so the first thing that i would recommend is um obviously first you need to be technically strong uh second uh you need to have conversations open conversations with your manager on how you see yourself uh 
you know, like what your expectations are from the job and obviously understand what he wants to. Um, and so these are what one-on-ones are used for. Like that's what typically I use my one-on-ones for to get feedback on how I'm doing, you know, like, uh, so there's a concept called managing up as well. Um, wherein, so I believe that everyone has some kind of leadership form a leadership ability that they need to portray at every stage in their career. Uh, and managing up for early in careers is one of them. It's where you understand how your manager operates, you make life easy for them. Uh, so this is one thing that can be done, you know, to help your manager as well as you grow. Uh, the second thing is uh, taking responsibility, you know, showing that you can take on more work and more challenges, um, being proactive about it. And the third thing is, you know, you get mentors or people outside outside of your current day-to-day job who can guide you. Uh, so there's this also another concept called the board of, uh, board of directors that you form. Uh, and these can change over the years. So one is the mentor. A mentor is someone who, you know, will come and tell you, uh, will guide you. Uh, then you have like a, what do you say, a informational powerhouse. That's someone who you go to for, uh, you know, questions related to uh, like a specific tech area. Uh, and you can have multiple of these because different people will be experienced in different uh, areas. Um, and then you have uh, the coach. The question the is, coach. Question, yeah. question is, what is the, I mean, after getting into Microsoft as a software developer, is the next role a, a senior software developer, then you move to team lead or how does the progression work and how many years to get to? And if, let's yeah. say you don't enjoy software developing, I mean, cloud development down the line and you say that you know what i don't want to become a software engineer but i want to do something in product development is it okay. possible to steer your career to a different direction okay so for the first question uh, so software engineer one but then mm-hmm. the software engineer two the senior and that's this principle uh, to become a manager or a lead uh, you can either, if you're really good, they make you, they can make you a lead at software, uh, at senior or uh, principal. And even within software engineer one, that's 59, 60. In software engineer two, that's 60, uh, 61, 62. And uh, for the lower bands, you can get promoted every year. Uh, but for the higher bands, it might take like two, two to three years. Uh, and this is for each level. So 59 to 60 is generally a year. 60 to 61 is when you touch software engineer two, and that's usually a year. Um, but there are cases where if you're exceptional, they will promote you quicker in six months. Um, and we have some internal review process that's called the connect. Uh, and that's what used to kind of determine how your growth has been. Yeah. Okay. Now, what if you, the second question is, let's say I started as a software engineer and a developer and I, and I said, you know what, this is not for me. I have too many geeks in my thing and too many good coders. How do we... And if I want to get into product development, how can a uh, product management, can I move? Can I steer my career in that direction? Definitely. I actually know someone from my team who did that. Um, and that's where he eventually wanted his car to go. Uh, it's pretty easy. Um, I would say it's in, easier to switch within Microsoft because that credibility kind of gets established when you're working at Microsoft uh, versus if you were to go to a company outside. Uh, so just to cite his example, he switched from my team to another team um, uh, and became a product manager. And then eventually six months later, he went to another company where he eventually wanted to be. Uh, so I thought that was something really smart. Okay. And then so he there went is that... straight there. Yeah. Wow. So basically what you're saying is it's possible. Now, how did you prepare for the interviews? Did it, it was a lead code that you used or what did you use for in terms of preparing for the interviews for to getting to Microsoft? Uh, um. So definitely lead code, yes. Um, no matter how, if, I don't know if anyone denies it, but that is the way I think for coding interviews, that is the way to go. Um, also important, it is also important to be uh, able to explain what you're thinking. Uh, when you're solving a problem, I think communication is very important because Microsoft, uh, when, I inter- when I interviewed for Microsoft, they were more interested in how I was thinking versus the result that I got. Um, and when, um, so I had four rounds of interviews for my final interview. And the last round was basically getting to know me as a person as well um, and seeing how I would fit into the culture. Um, so you need- And what were the first four know, rounds on, focused on? Uh, coding, mostly. So it was more of a whiteboard type of coding or actually giving yes. you a computer whiteboard. and tell him whiteboard, whiteboard. coding. Yeah. So they just want to see the logic that you would apply to get to where you want to be, not worried about the syntax as such. 
correct correct exactly and that's exactly why what i mentioned earlier was you know like syntax is just like decoration around the actual logic uh, i mean the language is, doesn't really matter um, yeah and uh, the last round was basically getting to know me how i fit i would fit into the company culture and yeah awesome awesome let me ask you with number of with all these companies a big tech do you feel that once you're in a big tech or you got someone like in a microsoft or one of these bank based companies or this it makes a difference from a career growth perspective um, do people look at you differently i mean like you mentioned your your uh, one of your peers did they look at him differently because hey he's coming out of microsoft which is a huge name in the industry um i would say yes uh, around 70% Um, why I say that is because um, if you like, this is what I have seen in terms of you know, like when you switch companies. Uh, so I know. Let me give an example. Uh, I knew an engineer, a senior engineer, who moved, who was trying to move from Expedia to uh, Microsoft. Um, and uh, when he tried to do that, like his offer was like, he was getting promoted, uh, demoted to like a software engineer. Uh, so I feel like uh, I've seen a lot of these. happen uh, but when you move from big tech to big tech like you get to re- keep your seniority you know like which i think is really important for career progression um, so definitely it does help what is the work life balance uh, at uh, microsoft okay. um i would say it's great um, i am pretty happy because you know like the flexibility that i was mentioning earlier uh people are really accommodative they understand that if you have something you not need to take care of you can go um in terms of like things like pressure or you know stress that add to the work life balance uh, uh i think as long as you have clear communication with your manager and goal setting uh, i think it 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 it's a really good work life balance so, yeah so would you say would you say that because obviously everyone is assessed individually and uh, from a valuation perspective is it a collaborative environment is it an environment that is a more of a individualistic how would you define the environment and when you have assigned a task is it where you have to do every prefer everything to figure it out yourself uh, or is it where this this constant support available to you okay and if you were looking at when you were actually getting out and the second part of this question is did you have any inhibitions of moving into big tech as so to speak away because you're dealing with the best of the best yeah okay um so definitely it is a collaborative environment uh, one of our missions is like one microsoft um so there is collaboration within the team as well as different orgs or organizations or you know products within microsoft as well um and any time you know like i have been stuck uh, i am i don't need to hesitate to reach out to my teammates or my manager you know or you know uh, so back in office when back in the day when we used to go to office uh, we used to have like whiteboard sessions where we used to collaboratively come up with a design you know like for a new system or whatever um and people here are really really knowledgeable um, so tying back to your second question uh, you will always have that innovation or you know it's called imposter syndrome thinking that you're not enough or you know like how do i get there or you know like what am i doing here this is not the right place uh, but that is something that happens to people in all career levels i have had mentors who have told me that you know even when they get promoted to a new level uh, they're like okay should i be here um, but i think it's very natural and it shows that you're human you know your vulnerabilities um so i think microsoft is a great place because people help you like even if they're busy you know they let you know that hey i can't do this now but i will love to I, i will help you later you know um, so yeah great 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 uh in terms of in terms one question came up with again coming back to preparing for the interviews because i think a lot of people are asking about it from an interview perspective because they would love to get into a dream job like you into microsoft is how did you actually use lead code effectively and what did you what else did you do other than lead code to get to where you wanted to be because the four rounds of interview obviously are going to be stressful as uh, they are unique questions but did most of the questions come out of lead code did they come out of is it just the the uh, understanding the logic that you learn from lead code or what specifically 
and how did your curriculum help you your undergrad your grad school curriculum help you through this process all right um so yes um lead code um, i would say there can be an overlap of the questions that come up uh, but uh, more importantly like the understanding and you know the exposure that you get to different kinds of problems and being able to think um also helps you solve like so any you can use any platform that has like coding questions right like uh, that will help your brain start thinking in that direction and how to tackle these problems um for me how i prepared was um i used to like try to so it was more of a staggered approach uh, so let's say i have my interview on the next day the previous day i would probably take it easy but the days before that a week i used to like religiously solve at least 10 to 15 problems you know like sit and you know like get my head into it and be in that space um and then i would recommend you know solving at least one to two problems when you are in the interview season every day so that your mind uh, you know something you build muscle memory or you know like your brains are like your brain cells are constantly exercised um so that is one thing and then apart from that like i said communication you know you need to be able to talk to the person and explain what you are thinking clearly um but also it is a collaborative effort so you don't have to sit and solve the problem if alone and this ties back to like what you asked earlier if it's a team if a t- if it's a team effort or a single effort they want to see how you get along with people in your team and if you can solve a problem together uh, yeah great 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 uh the last question that i want to ask you and most important question i the two questions i want to ask you the one question is that uh did you find people who got into microsoft who got into big tech coming from non cs backgrounds into yes. microsoft as a software programmer a software developer and what type of backgrounds what was the diversity of the backgrounds uh, um so yes i have seen that uh, short answer uh, so i have seen people come from electrical from mechanical uh, to be honest though the ratio has been lesser obviously um so either these people do like a degree uh, so back at usc uh they had a program specifically for people from non cs backgrounds to do a masters in cs um so i think that was really good um uh for mechanical i do know some people who actually also come directly from india um uh, and these are people who have like passion projects on the side or you know like they are they just realize they want to do software and not you know like the other uh, engineering branches and they get into it by themselves Uh, so definitely that's possible too if you have the passion for it great 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 uh so uh, second next question i want to say any parting thoughts you want to tell the student community because i think a lot of people will be vying for the type of job that you have what can you tell them from a perspective is how do i get into a big tech okay what do i get into big tech so first i would say is network 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 now um, that is essential not for your just for getting into a job but uh, lifelong um, the connections you build now will probably help out later or you can help out later you know it's all about like helping each other out to go up um that is one thing the second thing is um i think don't lose hope um and just keep hustling like i think hard work goes a long way and uh, if you have the passion for it combined with the hard work uh, you'd be great um, and also try to get like mentors um uh, that is something that has helped me a lot you know if you just want to go ask them about anything uh, and if they don't have the answers they try to go ask other people or you know get other opinions uh, and i think diverse set of opinions always helped um so yeah those are the three things i would say and getting an h1b has not been an issue at all i assume um no so honestly it's lottery based i i know friends who haven't got it and like i lucked out uh, that word um but yeah i think every so year does, the number of does um, microsoft support the people even though they didn't get the h1b after 2 3 years to move them to canada or some other jurisdiction and bring them back yes yes they do that a lot um, i know a friend of mine who didn't get the h1b and now he's moving to vancouver they'll try again to bring him back on h1b if not l1 visa uh so microsoft is very supportive in terms of any immigration matter great 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 thank you very much riti for being with us i think quite honestly a lot of people got their doubts cleared with respect to the whole perspective 
and this is great very insightful uh students are talking about it and you've been great thank you very yeah, thank much thank you so much for having thank me. you for being up early in the morning early morning i know it's a long weekend but i apologize no no worries um, yeah if i have any, if anyone has any questions of we will definitely read. if anybody has any questions if they can just send it to info@collegepond.com and we'll assimilate them and send it to you with with the okay. thank you very much thank you bye thank you now we the next session we're going to have is going to be uh getting a hold on machine learning craze okay we have double joining us uh with respect to uh machine learning uh, i'm just waiting for double to come in uh, if you can just give me a oh. second i'll just join you in a second as soon as double joins in oh hey suraj uh, i'm hey, on double, the call hey double how are you good good how are you it's so nice to see you good so nice to see you double you you slanted i am not seeing you straight oh yes so, uh, give me one second sorry for that uh is this better uh, this is excellent double it's so good to see you after okay. a long time hey. <laughs> nice to see you suraj how are you doing good 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 uh double this is the first time we're doing something like this and i think it's doing extremely well i think it's a lot of students are appreciating the fact that you're on board mm -hmm. to talk about yes, machine definitely. learning and all that because it's a craze out there every student yeah. every third student is asking or every second student is looking at the machine learning or data science machine learning data science so Correct. i want you to demystify the craze and really talk about machine learning and deep mm. learning uh So let me give some background. The uh, let me give some background about Double. Double completed his. Uh, Double, you want to introduce yourself rather than me introducing you? Oh yeah, sure, sure. And uh, excuse me if I yawn in between. It's really early morning out here, so I apologize. I for that apologize in again, Double, yeah. to get you up early in the morning. <laughs> oh, I that's totally fine. That's totally fine. Time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, quick introduction. Uh, I did my masters from USC in computer science. uh just to set things clear i did not take any machine learning or data science specific course uh it was just masters in computer science uh i have worked at electronic arts uh as most of you might know as ea sports for 3 years so over there i worked for 2 years as an ml engineer slash data scientist and the last one year over there was uh, as an ml platform engineer and after that i switched to doordash so uh, for those of you all who don't know doordash is like the zomato of usa out here so over there i'm currently working as an ml platform engineer as well so that's like a quick introduction and yeah happy to answer any questions that Great. you might so have so double let me explain simple terms what do you do and yeah. why is it so significant why are people all going after this craze correct correct so uh, that is actually my goal for today as well uh, i would like to get through this message that please 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 don't come to us uh, with this blind idea that i want to get into machine learning or data science uh, there are a lot more opportunities out here lot more fields roles to explore so please keep your minds open uh, happy to answer any machine learning questions but please don't be like okay don't have that tunnel vision that i just want to get into machine learning without even knowing what you are getting into so uh, i can just quickly start maybe by giving a very high level idea of what machine learning is if you don't mind suraj like just please 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 i'm going to leave it to you you got 30 minutes so i'll give it to you oh okay sure great uh, so machine learning like as the term suggests is basically teaching the machine uh, to learn something like to learn a pattern from some historical data like a very simple simple example i can give you here is uh training a model uh to maybe predict whether you should give out a loan to a specific person or no this is a very simple example so in this case uh you feed like historical data to the model and the model will learn like what sets of people uh are highly unlikely to repay that loan to the bank like maybe people of a certain age group or of certain race certain gender something like it will learn that uh, pattern from the data you feed it and then when a new customer comes in uh, asking for a loan you feed in all the parameters for that customer and the model will basically output whether this loan should be approved or not this is a very simple example so it's just teaching the machine to do something from some data you have collected uh, from your past experiences 
uh now if you come into uh the ml field there are three main uh kind of job profiles you are looking at uh so there's the data scientist there's this ml engineer as we call it and then there's the ml platform engineer which i currently uh work as so i can give a high level idea of each and maybe uh dive deeper into what my work is as yeah, an ml please, platform please. engineer yeah please just if yeah. you can also if you can also draw the entire chain of how data mm-hmm. gets translated through into your how does it come to you and with, with the entire process of data gathering to ml uh, to the ml engineer just walk walk someone through the entire process so that would be great right. so yeah so that is actually a completely another field as well what we call as data engineers out here so they are the ones responsible for collecting data from various data sources and by data sources i mean uh, some user has clicked on a specific movie title on netflix now that is a data source for them like okay suraj is clicking on uh, for example say stranger things now that is a data source now this will be fed into one of their models which might uh, learn that okay suraj is interested maybe in like uh, horror thriller shows or something on those lines so this data engineers will do this work of collecting data from several data sources uh, even like process them uh, in a way that the ml engineers or data scientists uh, expect the data to be in uh, collect them uh, put them at a common location which could be like a data warehouse or something so snowflake is one example of a data warehouse there are several other options out here and then what ml engineers and data scientists do is they access this data which is already like prepared for them they will do their own pre processing on it uh, as per their use case uh, they will design the model architecture feed the data to the model and get some output from that this is a very high level uh, workflow of how it works end to end so uh as you can see there is a lot of overlap between even data engineers data scientists ml engineers like there's a lot of overlap in the work they do uh so does that answer your question it does but i want to understand what is the, as an ml engineer you mentioned what is a platform engineer what is a data scientist because this there seems to be a lot of overlap like you mentioned correct and what is the distinction between the three yes. or is it like yes everything is all all together the same thing in this different uh... Uh, yeah it's it's very confusing for even someone who is working in the field it's sometimes very confusing like uh, to distinguish between an ml engineer and a data scientist so i have prepared like this uh, very high level idea which might demystify some of these things uh, so data scientists are mainly involved in training the models they just care about preparing the data training the models and that is it and most of the times uh, we associate the term data scientists with people who are involved in more researchy projects so they are doing like this cutting edge work uh, they are reading papers that are being published by uh, data scientists at other companies like google facebook uh, read papers learn from them try to develop their own model architectures and be at the cutting edge of data science basically so i'll give you a quick example uh, at ea my first team was a data science team so what they were working was on a text to speech use case so basically in all of their games uh, the voice overs that you hear uh, they are actual voice actors being called into the recording studio to record those lines like for example fifa commentary lines or something like that so those are actual people who have come to our studio and recorded those lines for us now this is a huge waste of time and resources uh, for example after the recording is complete say you want to change a line or something you will have to again call in the actor just to record those couple of lines again so they were working on this new idea where you just feed in the text to the model and as an output you get the audio file in the voice of the commentator so for that you need hours and hours of training data in the voice of the target commentator that you want the synthetic voice to be in now this is not a solved problem text to speech over here like there are uh, some companies uh, who are doing uh, good work in this area but it's still not like a solved problem 
So we would just read papers uh, that the Google text-to-speech team would publish every month, every week, Facebook would publish, and try to modify it to fit our use case. So as you can see, this was more of a research-oriented problem. Uh, there was no urgent need to uh, put this into production, as an example. Now, whereas ML engineers, they also deal with training models, but uh, they also deal with how can we productionize these models. So now an example here would be at DoorDash, uh, one of the ML use cases we have is uh, what restaurants should we show the user when they open the app? So when you open the app and what you see might be completely different than what I see on the app. Now, this is based on your ordering history, your preferences, uh, the kind of restaurants you like. The model has learned like a profile for Suraj and a profile for Dhaval. So even if we are in the same area, same city, we might see the same restaurants, but maybe they are arranged in a different order. So over here, this is not a research problem. This is more of a recommendation problem. And uh, the ML engineers also need to deal with how do we put this in production? So basically when the app opens, how do we run this model for the user? How do we popul populate their home feed? So on and so forth. So a very clear distinction here is data scientists don't have to deal with all of this engineering work. They just train the model and that is it. Someone might take over from there now to productionize it in future. And then there's this third field uh, which is coming up, which is known as ML ops or ML platform. Uh, so I work as an ML platform engineer over here. So when I mentioned that ML engineers also need to productionize the models, the ML platform team will help them do that. So uh, to draw a very simple parallel, uh, software development is more or less a solved problem. Uh, for example, you have GitHub uh, for version control of your code. Uh, you have several like these CI CD tools like Jenkins or even GitHub CI CD that help you with all of these pipelines and everything. And basically, you know, like from the design process to coding to implementation, there are hundreds and hundreds of tools available for everything. Now, ML ops is slightly different because uh, uh, how do you version control your models? Uh, say months or years down the line, you want to know what code was responsible to generate this specific model. How do you go back to it? Uh, for example, you have a model in production, but now it's drifting away. So a very, very good example of this is uh, at DoorDash, we had a model uh, which would predict how often a specific user is likely to order food from outside. Now, this model had sort of learned over the years that during the summertime, uh, the users are most likely to go out and go to the restaurant rather than calling the food in. But now in this COVID, it completely threw the model off because even though it was summer, they were not going out to the restaurants. They were still calling in food because everything was shut due to lockdown. So this is what we call as model drifting. Like there is a model in production, but you can't just say, okay, it's done. You will have to constantly update this model with new data, uh, with new use cases. So how do you avoid model drifting? How do you update models in production? All of this is what an ML platform engineer will help the ML engineers and the data scientists do. So they will build these services and tools that will sort of uh, provide everything you need right from model development to putting it in production and monitoring it in future, like I said. Okay, so let me ask you, what uh, what is it? Obviously, you spent two three years at EEA, yeah, this Electronic Arts and R at your DoorDash. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, what two questions? Simple is what is your day to day projects like? Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you do? Is it uh, is it working on different? Are you working on the same product and just improving the ML or is it just different projects coming in that focuses mm. on this as, as opposed to a software engineer where they keep on developing the functionality of a product? Correct, correct. Yeah, so at EA for my first two years, uh, I was only focused on the text-to-speech use case. So I was on that team. Uh, and as I said, it was even when I left the team, it was still not a solved problem. We were still trying to improve the model, read papers, do some more research into that field. 
so it was exclusively working on text to speech use case that is it it was just a team of like four or five people at max uh just working on this one project but it was about how to we how do we constantly make it better so uh we had gotten to a stage where okay we feed in text we get the output but now how do we make the output sound in the emotion that we want to for example if a goal is scored versus a goal is conceded the commentator should sound different like he might sound excited versus disappointed in these cases now how do we control the emotion how do we control the pitch of the voice and all of that so even though it was just one project text to speech it had like several of these minor projects under it now as an ml platform engineer uh i work on different different uh, services like as i said at ea i was mainly involved in the model training side like if a user wants to come and train the model uh how do we provide the services to do so like how do we provide the infrastructure to do so like if it's a simple model maybe like a cpu is enough but if it's like a more complex more heavy model they might need gpu clusters now how do we set those up for them uh then how do we provide tools to train the model to track the model and so on and so forth but even under ml platform there are like these five six main pillars i would say like there is feature engineering there is model monitoring there is model training so it depends from project to project uh, we interact heavily with our ml engineers and data science team at doordash uh, we find out what their needs are so for example nowadays there are like these entire companies uh, who just focus on providing ml platform solutions so our customers might come to us and say oh aws sage maker is giving us this feature uh, would it be possible for you guys to uh, build it for us for the ml platform at doordash and then we might take it up and just work on delivering that one feature or service for the next 5 or 6 months and maybe jump to the next one after that but we constantly work on improving the existing tools and services as well so in simple words uh, what i do right now is software engineering but with a very uh, big focus on just ml use cases okay got it got it okay what skills do you think were very relevant i know you didn't focus on ml when you were at usc hmm. what skills were yeah. very relevant uh in hindsight that a student should have if he's thinking of getting into ml and what Correct. are the opportunity uh, that's the first question and the second question what are the opportunities for a newcomer to ml Correct. because is uh, because there is a lot of students who are looking at ml as a field okay and yes. uh, it's quite trending so what are the opportunities what correct uh so regarding the skills i would say uh the first category i spoke about data scientists uh over there you might need to have a very strong grasp on uh, maths and statistics so i was very lucky because uh, i actually had an internship with ea during my summer break which got converted to a full time but if you are someone who is directly trying to get into a data science role as a full timer uh they usually usually reserve it for phds or people who have done their masters in like statistics or maths or some of those fields for data uh, science but yeah for data scientists okay uh but for ml engineers and ml uh, platform uh software engineering with maybe say like uh, a couple of courses in machine learning so at least uh you need to have a good understanding of the different kind of models the different kind of ml algorithms like classification regression so on and so forth because uh you just need to understand what your customer needs are in this case but in the end your day to day work would be more aligned with software engineering so those are the skill sets i would say and regarding the scope so like machine learning is everywhere over here like from tech and it industry where every application is trying to like personalize the experience to your needs as i said what restaurants you see versus even on netflix uh, this is like a very cool thing they do so uh, even the movies and shows you see the thumbnails that you see for those movies are personalized to your profile so for example if they have identified that suraj likes kids shows for example uh for a show like stranger things the thumbnail might involve those four or five kids in it 
but uh, if it has learned that dhawal likes horror mystery shows the thumbnail might be that big monster in the show or something like that so they want to uh, maximize the possibility of you clicking on the show and actually watching it so to that uh, level of that's like you're saying to that level of detail yeah, yeah. the image is different for each person oh not even the image so currently they are working on personalizing the trailer as well so if they know i like these horror thriller shows they will pull up all those clips from the show and create like a customized trailer just for me so when i watch the trailer i'm immediately in- intrigued like oh this is like a good horror show let me watch it like for someone who likes kid shows the trailer might look completely different like so thumbnails the description the trailer they are going to that level now wow so yeah so in the it tech industry they are trying to like customize the experience as much as they can uh, so that you enjoy your time on the app uh, uh, then the, even in healthcare even in banking like the loan example i gave uh, in healthcare like there are these ml models that will now look at the patient's history and uh, maybe diagnose something that a doctor might miss uh even in the legal field like where these lawyers have to go through piles and piles of documents there are now models that will just scan those documents in a matter of hours and maybe create like a quick summary for them which is like really helpful uh another hot area currently being worked upon is self driving over here so a lot of companies are getting into that like self driving cars drones and all of that so uh the demand is quite high for ml engineers for data scientists currently over here but like i said uh please don't get into the field of machine learning just because it sounds cool or just because it's like the current hot uh field uh software engineering is like a pretty big umbrella as well so there are lots and lots of opportunities over there too uh but if you are someone who is really interested into machine learning then yeah there are ample opportunities don't be scared uh just pick your course correctly uh and get some idea before getting into it so this is my personal experience because at ea i got like as i said for the first two years i was on a data science team uh initially i was very excited i was very happy uh that oh being a master student i got got into like a data science team but within 2 years i quickly realized that model training and just dealing with data is not my cup of tea i am more interested in the software engineering side of things uh luckily for me we had a sister team over there that was building ml platform at ea and i could switch internally which helped me get this new role at doordash but uh what i'm trying to say here is even though it sounds cool uh you might not know if you actually like it till you actually study it or work on it so come over here take those courses see if you like machine learning see if you like dealing with data math statistics and then take a decision so yeah double question uh, two questions that came up uh, as you were today, giving uh, as you were oh, talking yeah. and giving insights about machine learning uh one question that dealt with is that what's important from a resume perspective when you're looking at recruiting uh is it mm-hmm. the projects that you worked on is it the in past experience as a software engineer what do they look for when they uh, look at so this, this is yeah. not just for machine learning right like in general in general but more related to ml slash ds type of stuff mm-hmm. uh yeah so it's it's going to be mainly the projects that you work on in your college and past experience will also matter if it's relevant to the field you are applying for so a lot of people show some two month three month internship in india or something like that uh it's fine as long as it's relevant uh even job experience like if you have one and a half two years of job experience and for example you are someone who is trying to get into front end engineering and say for 2 years you actually worked like on a front end team or something similar then it would matter so relevant work experience definitely matters uh projects will matter a lot the kind of projects you work upon uh, in your college days uh, the kind of courses you take will matter a lot too and uh, in the end even the college so uh the brand name of the college will help you get more uh interviews more uh jobs 
for sure like the alumni network like uh, for example at usc if you reach out to someone uh, on linkedin and just be like okay hey could you refer me to this role or something like that and if he or she is an usc alumni uh, chances are pretty high that they might refer you so yeah a strong alumni network uh, on resume just have good courses in your school uh, take uh, good projects uh, yeah that is it great great a quick question about usc that came through uh, in terms of uh, would you suggest someone to take a degree in ai from usc or just stick to cs Uh, there's specialized so degrees is, out there. You know what I'm saying? That every every school is yeah, coming yeah, with specialized yeah. degrees now. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, it's really good to go into the specialized uh, course if you are hundred and one percent sure this is what you want to do. Uh, for someone like me, I wasn't sure. Like when I came to US, I was more interested in networking side of things, like the whole TCP, ICP, and all of that. and uh, it hasn't worked out for me like luckily i took uh, the general computer science i took maybe a course on networking and i realized okay this is not for me even though i was interested in it before i came to us uh, i remember jimit explaining this to me like okay you aren't 100% sure about networking uh, i wanted to go for masters in computer networks at ncsu that was one of the better colleges around for networking course and he was the one who made me realize that okay if i'm not 100% sure why not go for computer science uh, where also i will have the opportunity of taking networking courses but i'm not restricting myself just to that one field so if you are 101% sure this is what you want to do you have done your research and everything then yes a specialized course will definitely help but also take a look at the list of courses you can take for the general computer science and if it has the kind of courses you like i would say keep your options open there okay uh two questions that i have uh, i know we're running out of time yeah. but i just want to yeah we've got 3 minutes so i'm going to make it i'm going to make it really quick uh an important question is what is the career pathway for an ml engineer where do you see your career progression mm-hmm. going yeah so uh, career path is very similar to what a software engineer might go through so there is ml engineer level maybe 1 2 3 senior ml engineer so on and so forth uh, it varies from company to company but from what i have seen uh, whatever role you are in be it software engineer be it ml engineer uh, after a level or after a stage you are always presented with this opportunity of do you want to continue in this path or maybe do you want to pursue management or get into like a manager kind of a role so it's very similar to software engineers you will progress through these levels maybe get a choice between continuing there or being a manager and then you can go on from there basically great 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 and uh, the second question that comes into it, so i would assume that you can always switch from an ml engineer to software engineer relatively easily if you don't like ml you can move to a pure software engineer relatively easily a pure yes, software from engineer from ml engineer to software engineer yes uh, but if you are into pure data science like i said it might be very difficult so even when i switched in ea like from my data science team to the ml platform engineer team i was overwhelmed by the whole engineering thing going on over there because i had never done engineering in my life at that point i was just focused on training models and that is it i had not worked with aws uh, i didn't know how to like uh, work with github what is like this git pull git push and all of that so i was completely completely uh, overwhelmed by everything going on there so i would say that is a more difficult switch uh, but from ml engineer to ml platform and from software engineer they are like all overlapping fields out there so yeah that has been my experience at least there will any last minute comments suggestions you want to give to the student fraternity in hindsight what would you do uh, differently or what you should tell them to do oh yeah uh, sure just one thing uh, i have a lot of students from college one who call me as well and uh, they are like uh, from what i have seen students are more and more scared these days than what they used to be like few years back they are really paranoid uh, there were students who wanted to plan out their entire two years of masters they are like okay can you help me pick courses for my first sem second sem third sem <laughs> i'm like okay that is a bit too much like uh, just come over here 
look at the kind of courses you might not even like uh, what you have planned before coming to us like it happened with me so there are ample opportunities out here don't be scared uh, don't plan everything to the very last detail keep your minds open uh, keep your options open and everything will just work out like just take it step by step be dedicated and that is it like enjoy your masters life basically don't be worried all the time thank you dawal thank you very much for joining us i think yeah, thank I think you for having me a... and so yeah, do like wake you for... up that early on a weekend Oh no no I'm going for a hike anyway so this helped me uh, wake up on time so don't worry <laughs> and you, yeah for you. all the students like feel free to reach out like on linkedin or email or anything and I'll be happy to answer the questions great thank you very much dawal yeah thank you suraj bye welcome amita and shreyas how are you guys long time hi suraj i still so remember nice you guys you. coming to the office and talking to your <laughs> applications Hey sir, how's it going? Good, 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 good. Okay, uh, to start off with, we just had a session on machine learning, as you could probably hear, you probably figured out. Uh, you want to introduce yourselves individually, and the focus today is going to be data science versus business analytics, data analytics, Amita. So I want to get both views because if people get confused between the two. Even I'm confused sometimes. You know, people say, "Should I do analytics? Should I do computer data science?" So let's first introduce you to Amita. Will you like to give a background about yourself? Of course. Okay. So hi everyone. I am Amita Zaptiwale. Um, I did my uh, masters in business analytics from Carlson School of Management uh, at the University of Minnesota. Um, I am currently working as a specialist uh, data engineering with McKinsey. I've been here for about five years now in the firm. and uh, previously i've had experience in financial services uh, especially uh, jp morgan chase in india um, i still yeah. remember the jp morgan chase days of yours <laughs> yes <laughs> okay so as uh, shreyas uh, would you to go ahead with yours and then i want to ask the question between what does amita do and what do you do but let's sure. start with shreyas first Uh, hey guys, uh, my name is Shreya Suryanshi. I graduated from University of Maryland uh, from an, a master's in information systems, and I have been working with the United States Pharmacopeia for almost three years. Uh, so I started off as a data analyst, and now I've been uh, I've been working as, as a data scientist. So hopefully, I'll have some some relevant knowledge to share today. Uh, so yeah, looking forward to this session. Okay, Amita, question. Both of you, you can answer. Anyone can answer this. What is the similarity? What is the difference? um specifically data science and data analytics yes okay okay i am going to give you my version of it yeah please because, please please because it varies know, from it's company to company so it's been yeah so don't worry it's it's company to company everything varies this but i want insights because that's the reason why we want to get both of you give both of your insights because it's very different right go ahead right so uh from my perspective data analytics is more so like a broad term uh which refers to like the discipline you know in in some sense that uses raw data sets and you know unstructured whatever data sets to um kind of draw insights from them so there's there's a component of processing and you know converting the raw data sets into information and then it's about using that information to get insights more more so like business insights that for me is like a broad definition of data analytics when i think about data science and i do work a lot with data science teams as well at work it's it's more so that they are focused uh, on on the processes or the algorithms the scientific methods that are used to actually get those insights so it's like the data analytics space overall can be divided or you know broadly into like different roles so there's definitely data scientist who's more so focused on getting the data out and the insights out from the different modeling techniques then there's definitely data engineering who's you know whose focus is more so kind of getting from the raw data set so it kind of varies all the way through that's that's how so, i would put it so sure. so uh, i i just share but i want to get use cases from you guys to, to understand it in a in a context a business context as you go through what is business analytics then amita <laughs> okay <laughs> business analytics is then um uh to kind of uh tie 
the data insights, see, when you're looking for data insights, you're specifically starting with the business problem. Anything right. that you want to find in the data, it, you, you don't just go explore the data and find something and that is it, right? So it always has a business context to it. So tying the business and the data science and you know all these different pieces together kind of becomes business analytics. That's, that's how I would put it. Probably not a refined definition, but I can probably, you can think of it more so like a Venn diagram where, okay. you know, uh, it's it's more like the business context and the business problem at hand. Uh, okay. And you're looking at like the different data sets. So it like, you know, your technical skills, data skills all come into play and uh, like even statistics. So it's it's a combination of like, math, computer science, everything, but with a necessary business context, because otherwise like there's there's no use going into the data if you don't have a business problem. Exactly, so it's the intersection of all three is what you're saying effectively yep. in the Venn diagram. Yep. Okay, Shreyas, what is your view since yeah, I think I, I do agree with Amita and it's a, it's a, such a broad field and such broad definitions for these fields that you don't can't really tie a specific set of responsibilities or uh, responsibilities to this job titles. Job titles can be different and, and the responsibilities can vary based on the industry that you work in and the company that you work at. Yeah. But my general observation based on the, depending because I remember applying for all these jobs back when I graduated and I was looking at this different responsibilities and the responsibilities section of all these like job applications and and essentially you, as, as an analyst, be it like a data analyst or business analyst, because a lot of the times things overlap, your responsibility is to understand the business needs of the company. That mean, that can mean different things for different companies. And based on those business needs, you have to devise some sort of infrastructure or some sort of business KPIs that represent or are indicative of that of those needs. So actually, I actually reached out to my friend in Netflix uh, this week just, just to prepare for the session. And I asked him, hey, he works as a, as a senior analytics engineer. And I asked him, well, hey, what's your role? What do you do? Uh, I especially I reached out to him because Netflix is such a, such a popular platform and a lot of people interact with it, with this platform on a regular basis. So the example would make more sense. Uh, and his, his sole responsibility is to understand how the viewing behavior of, of Netflix's customers, how it has evolved um, over you know last decade and how it is evolved in different regions. Uh, so essentially, it comes where when you think about this problem, you have to have severe understanding of of, of Netflix's business model and what they are doing and how that business model has been has been you know evolving and how the data ties to that. So definitely, as a data analyst, you have to have serious understanding of the, of the of the business model of, of the company. When it comes to data scientists, the approach is rather more statistical or, or mathematical. You know, as Amita mentioned, it's a combination of different things. It's a combination, combination of computer science, uh, mathematics, and when I say mathematics, it includes calculus as well as linear algebra and that kind of stuff. Um, so as a data scientist, you would, your approach would be rather more statistical or more math mathematical. And your responsibility would be to create these predictive models um, predictive models which recognize certain certain patterns in the given data. And then you try to try to predict some behavior or some sort of like target variable on, on an unseen data. Um, and the example, like if you're talking about Netflix, it's I think the example is quite popular. Like if you go to Netflix, based on the content that you've viewed before, the platform suggests additional you know, viewing options. And that that is like the, the, the very popular example. And it, I think exemplifies what a role of a data scientist would be. Um, so yeah. Got it, got it. Okay, uh, both of you, I'll first start with Amita. Amita, what do you do from a uh, from a day-to-day -day perspective at McKinsey? Um, all right, so, so this is and gonna be as, a little bit- And how do you get into McKinsey? I think a lot of people, when they look at, when they look at finishing business analytics, the first thing they'll say is I wanna get to M MBB, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a feat to get into MBB. It's not that easy to get into MBB for any type of role for that matter. Okay, so what did what does it take to get into MBB and what do you do? And the fact that you've right. been there for five years, you're very happy there. So go ahead. Okay, um, I can probably take the second question first in terms of what do I do? Um, okay. And that, that can probably partially answer the first question a little bit. Um, so in terms of like mixing, like coming from the data analytics of the business analytics background, and then 
you know, going into an MBB or specifically McKinsey kind of firm, which is more so uh, geared towards like management or strategic consulting. It's it's a mix of both the skills. That is, um, I basically work on different client projects, um, which are more so data focused or the, the problem at hand is, it's often a business problem, but with the data context. Um, so my, my role specifically ranges from solving all different kinds of data problems. Uh, it, uh, I have, like I, I work on a lot of many implementation projects as well, uh, which uses different cloud services like AWS and Azure GCP. So can you give us a uh, use case, just a use case? I mean, I know it's, you can use, you don't give us the name of the companies you work with, just a use case, just to get an idea so people can relate to what right. you're saying. Okay, so to really distill it down and make it really simple, um, you can look at uh, my work ranging in like three major areas. One is the, and I'll get to the use case, but okay. uh, one is like, you know, heavy data engineering, which is like building out data pipelines and the data infrastructure. So it, it involves heavy coding. Uh, the second piece is like taking a little bit higher, which is data architecture. Uh, that is how you uh, design different components of the architecture. Uh, and then taking, a, taking it a little bit more higher is data strategy, where um, you want to build or you want to design a data architecture and infrastructure that maps to the roadmaps or the business objectives of the client. So, so these are like the three major areas, but it varies from like going, like getting the top level view to going, like, you know, going all the way down to the data and just like figuring out like, oh, if what data type is this column? So it's it's kind of waiting from there. So you need to have programming is what you're saying. You need to have a yes. knowledge, strong a strong background yes. in coding. Yes, definitely, definitely. Okay. And um, if I were to take a use case, um, uh, I can probably uh, give one example of a recent uh, near real time uh, uh, analytics use case that I was working on. So this was like a advanced analytics engagement. Uh, I was more so leading from the data engineering point of view, uh, but my role was uh, to basically uh, extract the data from on-prem databases. So this is a very um, sensor heavy project. So like think of it as, you know, different moving pieces of the client and um, to just extract the data and build out the entire infrastructure in GCP. Uh, like all the pipelines, which trigger every 10 minutes or so to generate the insights. And that went all the way to the, not just like getting the different data sets, but also transforming them, uh, you, you know, having some modeling. So there was a, another data science team also that I was working with, who kind of built out the algorithm and the model to uh, provide the insights. And that then uh, as an end product went into an app that was then real time again, uh, you know, uh, like basically uh, propagated to the client or the, the client users. Okay, okay, yeah. got it, got it, got it. And Suresh, from your perspective, oh, but wait a second, before I go to Suresh, uh, Suresh, sorry, Suresh, uh, I wanna speak to you regarding how do you get into MBB? Yes, uh, so about that, I would say it's um, like, I, I basically was looking to just get interesting jobs in the data analytics space. Um, I did not have a specific focus on consulting, but yes, consulting was definitely one of my top options, given that I would have exposure to different industries. And what I was interested to start with is to see the different data characteristics and the data problems in different clients, industry sectors, functions specifically. And um, the, earlier opportunity that I got while I was in the management school was, uh, you know, certain webinars that the career services had uh, conducted more so, I think one the alumni being from, from McKinsey. And it, it took more so of just, you know, networking, being in touch, being proactive about the process of, you know, showing your specific interests to kind of get to the point um, where I was, I was just um, selected for the interview, and then you know it was it was quite a process, and it was pretty long. Um, but yeah, that's that's how I ended up in McKinsey. And a lot of case interviews, I would say, a lot of case studies that they must have given it you. It was yes, and with respect to me, it was the case 
was also sp uh, focused on data. So I wouldn't say for like, it's it not like all the MBA folks who are thinking like, oh, like, you know, you want to increase the profits, you want to reduce the costs, things like that. That's not the case that you're looking for if you want a job in say, you can see digital. It's going to be more, um, you know, related to your role and focused on data. How big is the team and how much is it growing? Is it, are they recruiting every year? Because I think this is a... Yeah, so uh, like you see recruiting is big this year across the industry. That's that's what I've been seeing. It's very different from what it was last year. Um, and yeah, so there's definitely recruiting that goes on year on year um, for folks who are interested to apply. That's, that's all I would say. Shares coming back into a private background where you're working for a company. How, uh, what, shares? Yeah, he, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. The, the, the screen took time for to switch. Okay, yeah. <laughs> coming from a private background, tell me about yourself and tell me about yes. what you, yes, yeah, so what do you do and uh, in the first two years and now what are you currently doing? Sure, so, um, so Suresh, this is my first job and my, my goal for this job is to learn as much as I can. And mm -hmm. that is something that I've communicated to my managers. So every time there is something, some new project opportunity comes up, which can help me improve on a relevant skill, they try to put me on that. Uh, but my main role at, at USP has been to work with the, um, with the data on their online, online platforms. So essentially, um, let, let me tell you a little bit about the company because I don't think yeah, a lot of people think, are familiar with I this. Think, yeah, I think it's a yeah. better thing to go back. I was going to come back to that anyway. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so US Pharmacopia, they essentially produce reference standards for all sorts of pharmaceutical pharmaceutical products within US and on a, on a global scale. Uh, so what does that mean? So essentially, if you want some sort of tablets, you know, you, you have fever, you have cough, you want to get some tablets. But those tablets, they have to follow a certain standard that is set by the government or some sort of authority within that country or on, on a global scale. And those are the standards that we produce. Uh, so there are two different kinds of standards, documentary standards, which are essentially these, these documents, which are like uh, essentially like, like lab journals for, for, for scientists who work in the labs. And there are reference standards, which are like more physical products. So I work with the documentary standards. They are, all of them are hosted on this online platform. And it's a, it's a, it's a B2B company. So our, our customers are, are big businesses, pharmaceutical companies, and they, have, they access this website. And we collect all of that data. And my role is to, is to make sense of the data and feed in that data into different business processes. And one of the most recent projects that I've been working on is essentially looking at this data and identifying some sort of user behavior using some sort of clustering techniques. And based on, once we identify those behaviors or certain, certain groups of users, then we can, we can think about different business strategies as to target them or you know, discount them or, or different pricing strategies, strategies and that kind of stuff. Uh, but I have also been involved in, in supply chain projects within the company. Uh, this is the project that we that we worked with with McKenzie on. I'm not sure if it's a it's rather a secret information, but yeah, uh, we worked with a team from McKenzie, and um, uh, so essentially we're trying to model the supply chain of of the of, of different products because this was this project had like critical needs during the time of pandemic because we had so many different products related to COVID-19 and there was huge demand across across all the countries. And you know, we just had to had to figure out what are the supply chains for these for these uh, for these products and what are the possible vulnerabilities. So that is a product that is a project that that uh, that um, it was, my role was more of a data engineer in that in that project where I had to just develop this data asset using PySpark. Um, uh, so yeah, a lot of, a lot so, of different projects, sort of different. Uh, so uh, from a perspective, based. from a perspective, uh, so what is it? Let me ask you a question. I'm gonna ask the same way. What is the career progression for you? Yeah. In uh, in uh, data analytics, moving to data science, etc. Sure. So um, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna talk more about this uh, when we get to the coding part because I think it, it's highly relevant to that as well. Uh, okay. But essentially. It's, it's an evolving field and you have so many different things to learn. So even right now, I'm taking so many courses on Coursera just to understand some of the new things that were released in, in recent years, which I never learned in my school or which I don't get an opportunity to learn at my company because there are, there are different kinds of applications which can be which are not really relevant to my company's needs right now. So, um, so, like there, so the goal is to, to learn as much as I can at the company. Um, 
and the things that I'm missing out on, then go back to Coursera, learn them, and probably evolve as, as more as a, I'm, I'm personally interested in research. I definitely want to get into research at some point with, with, with one of the sophisticated firms. And, and that's, my, that's my ultimate goal. Okay. Amita, what's the career progression in McKinsey has been and what do you see yourself five years from now? Well, um, as in the career progression has been uh, good. The one thing that I like to say to everyone is that consulting, it's the, it is um, pretty challenging, taxing, yes, but it is also rewarding. Um, that's, that's the way to look. <laughs> I agree with you. You drop me, Amita. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Amita, we can hear you. Sorry, I am not able to hear you. I can hear you now. Uh, anything now? Completely, I can hear you completely now. Suraj, can you please type in? Because yeah, I'll I, type I in one second. I'll type in one second. I mean, that's right, rejoining. Yeah, go ahead and go ahead. And, in the meantime, Suresh, 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 yes. I'm keeping on. Okay, so tell me the career progression for you and uh, in terms of uh, where do you see, and actually we already discussed your career progression, but what, what, one question that came up is what skill set do you think students require, okay, to join data analytics, okay? And how should one differentiate or how should one actually dif differentiate or determine what's the right thing for them to do? analytics, business analytics, or data science? The second question is, is rather quite complex. So I'll, I'll start with the first one. <laughs> okay, so, go ahead. So if, you, if you're working as an analyst, um, you know, as, as I mentioned before, you need to understand the business needs of the company. So that does not really require any spe specific platforms, but you just, just understanding what the company does, how the business model works, because sometimes it's not that obvious. And a lot of the times you have to de define, uh, you have to define certain KPIs and this infrastructure to report on these KPIs. So that requires understanding of analytics platforms that includes Google Analytics, which captures data of, of, of all these online media. Then we have Adobe Analytics, something that my company prefers to use. And once you capture this data, you have to understand, you know, how, how do we store this data? What are the database management systems? We have so many different platforms coming out every day, every week, um, that there's always something new to learn. And once you understand how to store this data, you have to understand how to, how to report on that. And there are like a bunch of different tools like Tableau, uh, Power BI, just, pre, just simple understanding of, of or certifications of these, of these platforms could be, could be very helpful when you're starting out in these fields. Uh, when you're working in data science, it's again, as I mentioned, it's more statistical. So you have to have uh, some basic understanding of calculus, mathematics, um, some computer background, computer programming always helps. Um, but yeah, you need to, as to work as a data scientist, you need to have experience or, or skills in, in Python or R. Um, TensorFlow is always all, if you have experience in, with TensorFlow, that's, that's a good, definitely a plus point on, on your resume uh, because I think that's a skill set that a lot of people look for because I was looking at jobs at Amazon and most like all the senior data scientists required to have that specific skill. Um, so yeah. Would you, would, you, would, you, would you say that any specific courses you would have done before, in hindsight, you should have done before you did your, while you did your master's to create a better foundation for yourself? So it really depends on which background you come from. So I, I graduated from computer engineering. That was my, my bachelor undergrad course. So I had some basic understanding of, of data science itself and the programming. So I, I, to build up on that, I took several courses on Coursera and they have, um, you know, if you go there, there's this whole, a uh, batch called uh, uh, um, called deep learning, and they have like several courses listed there, and that's something that you can do. But even if you're even if you don't have programming background, or if you're coming from a different field of engineering or a completely different field, um, then you do probably need to just go back and understand 
how, how does it start? What are the basic statistical methods? Because once you understand those fundamentals, I mean, as I mentioned, like field is evolving, but the fundamentals don't. They they stay the same. So there's the same fundamentals just applying in different contexts and using some different variation of the fundamental uh, methods. So I think it should should definitely be helpful to go back and understanding those fundamental methods. Again, Coursera is a great platform. I feel like I'm I'm, I'm marketing Coursera right now in this in this, uh, <laughs> uh, in, in this video, but um, and that's uh, that's what I personally use. But there are a bunch of them out there. So you yeah, definitely go there and, and and even before you start with MS, maybe just some introductory courses are definitely helpful. And you don't even have to pay for any of this. You can always audit the course. You you need um, you need to pay only when you're taking certif certain certificates. But if you're auditing, it's for free. So there is no reason not to do it. Great. Amita, coming back to you, career growth and opportunities at McKinsey. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that, uh, <laughs> the technical glitch. Um, so I was, as I was saying, uh, there are a lot of uh, growth opportunities uh, and the career progression is, is good across the firm. Like uh, the, the, one of the major reasons why I've been here for five years and it doesn't seem like that is because every time there's a new problem, there's a new challenge, you work with a different, um, uh, you know, a different client in a different sector. It can be a different function, sometimes like operations, sometimes marketing and sales. And with that, you kind of grow even uh, more so from the tech stack point of view. As Shreyans mentioned, it is an evolving field and every client is going to use different technologies. So learning becomes a key part of your everyday life uh, where you are also learning and you're making sure that you're upskilling yourself um, in, in a very regular periodic manner. So in that sense, yes, uh, the, the career path is is good, good like in, in, in any form actually, like I wouldn't really say just in McKinsey, like this field is such that, you know, the career paths across the, and things are like specializing right now with just, it's not just a data engineer, but you do have like a BI engineer, ML engineer, you know, if you want to get, get, get into infrastructure stuff than DevOps engineer. So I think the career growth- Is it easier to move from A to B to C? Uh, so it, it really depends on what is A to B to C, like which okay. roles are you, are you moving from? I think Shreyansh touched upon it a little, or I, I guess the previous panelist, but Suraj so really depends if, um, like say from data engineer, if you want to move to being an ML engineer, probably you could do it because you understand the overall infrastructure and you know, you've, you've worked with different kinds of data all the way from the raw data sets. And now what you're focusing on is more so the model life cycle as an ML engineer. So that is probably possible, but going from ML engineer back, I'm not sure if you know you would have uh, knowledge of all or experience with the different cloud platforms. So it really kind of depends. If you, you're trying to go from where to where. Great. Or, oh, yeah. Okay. It shares a question for you. Uh, as an engineering bachelor student starting as a data analyst at a pharma consulting slash data science firm, can one switch into a higher level of application of data science into areas of healthcare, include genomics or bioinformatics? Uh, so uh, it's, it's honestly, honestly, it's a difficult question to answer. So let me start with my experience. Um, so it was very difficult for me to, at the beginning to understand, just understanding what the company does and how, how the company functions, how they're making money. And all of these things are important because every time, every small decision that you make, they have to, they have to at, at, at the company, it has to tie up with, with some sort of organizational goal. And it took me a while to understand those, 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 those business processes and how these how this company works, um, I think it would be kind of difficult for for a person from from computer engineering background to get into that because I I work with uh, certain data scientists who who previously worked in the labs as as lab scientists. I think they are more qualified to 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 get into you know the, the fields that you just mentioned because they have the fundamental understanding of of how how it works. But that doesn't mean you can't work with with the teams that work on these projects, because projects require like such diverse roles, um, you can always like you can always have some skill, or you can always have certain inputs for 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 um, the projects which are not relevant, completely relevant to you. Because I remember when I started working on the supply chain project, it was again same thing. It's just a completely new project, completely new concept. It takes time to understand how how the supply chain works, but 
but i think it's uh, once once you spend some time on it once you you know collaborate with your team members you get a get a hang of it okay uh just a just a couple of last few questions uh, i think uh, uh that i want to uh, i just want to discuss before we move to mother is uh, uh what in your mind what are the parting thoughts that you guys can leave because you both did you both uh, in your case amita you actually did a computer science background undergraduate and then you went to doing a masters in information systems and likewise you you went to ece and then computer engineering and then you did m masters in information systems was that in hindsight do you think those are the right decisions and what are your parting thoughts to students who are actually considering that as a career pro- progression from a degree perspective a academic progression um i think uh, probably the um, few parting thoughts i have for students considering this is that it's very important for them to clearly understand what they're really interested in uh, meaning that um, i i see a lot of uh, like with respect to recruiting i see a lot of folks who might be interested in pure software engineering skills but are looking at data engineering or the data analytics field only because it's the next big thing i would say probably that's that's not the way to look at it if you're really passionate about data about finding insights i think that is the way to go software engineering by itself is also still cool you know it's not something that is a thing of the past so just identify what your true likings are uh, and interest that's that's one second thing is for folks who actually join these uh, data analytics um, masters i would say that just learn as much as you can within the course um, but as shreyansh also mentioned that may, like keep us in mind that it would be a learning curve all the way as you go to the job so uh, courses and maybe certifications and getting familiar with different uh, tools and technologies and just understanding that this is going to be evolving and you know it's not like you learn like 1 2 3 and you know at all that's not going to happen new tools are coming in the space every day so learning is a key and third thing is with respect to um uh just you know like finding jobs and looking at career opportunities i think preparing yourself during the masters course is a key meaning that i would definitely invest some time at a regular basis to just you know prep for interviews all types case behavior technical technical is also important that's what i want to say and um take help or take guidance of the career services that are there to you know help with resume writing attend workshops career fairs because all of them they kind of help you build those networks which are going to be useful as you start looking for job opportunities um and while saying that i want to really clearly uh, you know just underscore that don't over index on the career opportunities part you're here to learn the different tools technologies the course the discipline focus on that but yes there should be a secondary focus on building that network finding people with similar interests and profiles as you go forward in your last semester for the actual uh, interviewing and the campus recruiting process that that be it great amita shares last thoughts um i i totally agree with amita i think networking is essentially is 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 absolutely essential uh be it during during your masters program or even after it's over and the key reason is not to not to get jobs the key reason is to understand what actually actually happens at these companies because the roles are so diverse and the responsibilities are so diverse and if you come if you're spending 2 3 years if you're getting your visa sponsored at a specific company then you need to understand So you're going to be there for a while, right? So you need to understand what you're doing is some is it, is it really something that you want to do? So getting in touch with people who have previously worked at that company, um, you know, your friends from from uh, college in Mumbai or your college in US, get in touch with them, understand what the role is. That is that is that is a key concept. Um, when it comes to data science, um, uh, uh, programming is essential. Uh, there are different levels of expertise required at different levels. If you go to Amazon, you'll see the roles as data scientist versus applied data scientist versus research data scientist. So the roles are different. The level of expertise and knowledge of 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 data science or programming is different. So understand what the difference is and and really like work towards what what your personal goal is and not really what 
what's considered good in the, the market or what, what will help you in the, in the long run, but just, just focus on your passion. Um, so yeah. And then with college Pond, you are in good hands. Uh, I don't know if Suresh remembers, but I actually interned with college Pond. I was in, sitting in the Martingo office for, for my whole one summer after my third year of engineering. Uh, and so I have like, not just mine, but like a lot of other people's experience to share. Uh, so you're, you're in good hands. They'll definitely find you help. Uh, they'll help yeah, you find I, the right I, university. I second that. I yeah. do. Like I remember Suraj reviewing my SOP to get to like version 15 or something, but yeah. I I would say that it's worth it. Like College Fund is has been a great support through the process. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you for being part of this. I really appreciate Thanks, it. Good catching up with you guys. It's Likewise. You. Thanks for calling us. Thank you, thank you. Okay, next we have Madhav Prabhu with us. Thank you. Madhav, are you there? Yes, I am. Good evening. How are you, Madhav? I'm doing good. How are you? Okay. Madhav, would you like to give a background about yourself? Sure. Uh, so I am a solutions specialist uh, here at Deloitte. I'm currently based out of Orlando, Florida. I recently joined Deloitte. Uh, and before that, I graduated uh, with a master's degree in computer engineering from New York University's Tannen School of Engineering. And before coming to NYU, I was working as a site reliability engineer at Reliance Geo India. Okay, so let me ask you one quick question. How does it, what's the experience at Reliance Geo versus at Deloitte? Uh, so the experience is quite different. Like the cultures are very different. Uh, if you want to thrive at Deloitte, you have to, your primary focus is networking. You have to keep on meeting new people. You have to, because uh, it's it's a client service company. So projects come in and you need to remind people what your skills are and what you specialize in. So you need to reach out to people uh, at a regular interval. Uh, with Geo, it wasn't the case. Uh, it, it was a product-based company. So when you're a part of the team, you get to work on new technologies. Uh, I was lucky that I was a part of the team that uh, was working on cutting edge technologies. So uh, the the experience is, I would say, quite different. Like it's it's way different than uh, like the paradigms are different altogether. Okay, which one do you prefer? Uh, I, I would say I am currently not at the position yet to identify exactly what I like because I joined Deloitte recently and so I haven't uh, got a chance to fully experience it. Okay, so Manav, today we're going to talk about cloud engineering. Yes. Okay. Uh, want to understand a lot of people are the cloud, the big buzz, Azure is there, Google yes. is coming up with theirs, I, Amazon, yes. AWS. What is cloud engineering? What does a cloud engineer do? Okay, so basically first I'll explain what exactly cloud engineering is and then I'll move with what does a cloud engineer do. So cloud engineering in, in a short description, cloud engineering is basically if a company wants to run their own databases, own networking components, they can uh, actually leverage these different service providers such as AWS and Azure to, do, uh, to maintain and maintain this infrastructure for them. So uh, over the last decade, there has been a big shift from companies uh, maintaining their own infrastructure to moving to AWS and Azure and GCP. So that is basically what cloud engineering in a short uh, description is. So what a cloud engineering does is uh, he leverages these different services that are provided by these organizations and try to and try to transform the businesses uh, that were running on these old paradigms such as their on-prem infrastructure and all of that stuff. So basically what, uh, again, a cloud engineer does is he architects the infrastructure on AWS or on, uh, I, I would say, service provider. Uh, again, there are different subsets to it. There, there is a cloud architect, there is a cloud developer, there is a cloud administrator. So a cloud architect, uh, basically uh, makes this infrastructure on the cloud. Uh, cloud developer is a software developer who develops applications on these cloud infrastructures. And a cloud administrator is basically maintains this infrastructure. So cloud engineer, I would say is again, a broad term. Uh, these are the subset of subsets of that broad term. 
great. And what skill sets do you believe that one should have in order to get it? Because this is like a booming field. It looks like everything is, yes. It's, it seems that the opportunities seem to be endless at this point in, in this, at this point in time. Yes. Because everyone is moving from their local data farms to the cloud. Yeah. So, so uh, basically the major skill sets that are required is, uh, again, it depends on what you want to go for. So uh, as I said, like these are the three things that people can aim to go for. So if you want to go for cloud architecture, you need to, you need to not only have technical skills, you also need managerial or business skills to go with it because you have to negotiate with these different cloud providers. In the end, your goal is to reduce the uh, operational and capital expenses of the organization that you're working for. So uh, a cloud architect basically uh, talks to these different vendors. He decrees, he tries to, uh, uh, I would say, negotiate in a way. So uh, for a cloud architect, that is a major uh, part of their job description. For a developer, you definitely it's the basics is software engineering and uh, a need to know uh, what tools that he can leverage to, he or she can leverage to basically develop applications on the cloud. And a cloud administrator, uh, he would, uh, he or she would have, you know, would need uh, Linux skills and cloud systems administration skills and a little bit of how cloud works. So this, I would say this would, this is enough to get them into those roles and then they can take it from there. How remunerative is its roles? If you have to guess, if you have to. I'm sorry, would you repeat that? How remunerative are these roles vis-a-vis a typical software engineering role? Uh, okay. Uh, that's that's like okay. Uh, could, could you like put it in some other way? Like I, okay. I, so I don't, so uh, that, how much care? How much do these as coming out of NYU or coming out of CES? Okay, in yes. terms of these oppositions. Uh, a, what are the certificate? What other certifications do you require? That's A. Okay. B is how much do you earn? I mean, how much can you potentially okay. earn out okay. of that? Okay. So uh, basically, uh, if uh, so, for a cloud engineer, you need uh, certifications such as uh, Linux certifications, then Kubernetes certifications. Kubernetes is a tool which is uh, for like which is used for. Uh, maintaining containerization environments, uh, orchestrating, automating uh, all of those uh, microservice architecture-based environments. So uh, Kubernetes certifications are a good head start. Then uh, definitely you need, irrespective of what you go for, any of these cloud engineering roles, I would suggest you need to know at least one programming language because uh, people think that cloud engineering is something that they can uh, like get into without a programming ba- background or without uh, any programming knowledge. Uh, so I would suggest definitely you need to be uh, proficient in either Python, Java, or Go. So the, these are the few programming languages that you can target. Uh, as compared to a software developer, uh, I would say uh, the remuneration is higher uh, because you not only uh, are uh, looking at the software development lifecycle, you're also looking at the infrastructure. So uh, basically, uh, also the fact that cloud engineers are more in demand. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, traditional companies such as uh, Google, Microsoft, they need software developers to develop their products. But uh, it's cloud engineering is very specialized. You need to uh, like have a diverse sk- set of skills, and that that puts you more in demand. You got it. And do you believe that you need to, uh, in terms of the demand, but do you need to have, that means you need to have a very diverse skill set. How yes. does one prepare for that skill set? Uh, There's a computer so, science curriculum, yeah, because the undergraduate curriculum that you went through was very yeah. basic and rudimentary. Yeah. So what, uh, do you think the MS curriculum has actually, pre- does prepare you or is it something that's on the job that you really pick up everything? And the certifications so, uh, matter. Okay. Uh, so basically, uh, I gained a lot of experience during uh, my work experience back in India. So I come from more of a network and hardware engineering background. So okay. 
I got introduced to the cloud native paradigm at Jio. So I got really interested in that. And uh, I, I didn't have much of a programming experience when I joined Jio, uh, but I was really motivated to like build my uh, portfolio there. So uh, I, I would say again, I was very lucky to get introduced to that. But at the same time, uh, the curriculum at NYU is, uh, it, it, they give you a lot of flexibility to choose uh, what you want to do. Uh, so I chose more of a DevOps engineering and a machine learning background. So that in the sense, the total uh, additions of my work experience and NYU, that itself gave me a, a, a diverse skill set. And I did things on my own. I did my own projects. Uh, and in case of certifications, uh, so I, I gave a lot of interviews. I gave almost about 100 interviews before I landed up with Deloitte. You're lucky. I had someone who gave 4,000, uh, <laughs> who applied for 4,000 positions. Oh my yesterday. God. <laughs> yeah. So uh, basically, uh, uh, so I got an opportunity to talk with a lot of people from these different companies. So the one thing that I made a point to ask them was, do certifications matter? Uh, would, do you look at candidates who are certified in these areas that you are looking for? So basically what I came to know was they, uh, companies tar- do want certification. It's not like, the, it, it. if you have it, it's good. If you don't have it and if you have trained for it, that is also okay. So the companies le- uh, try to gauge your knowledge uh, regarding the topics, uh, for example, Kubernetes or Linux, they would uh, definitely come to know based on the interviews, how proficient you are in these different areas. So, uh, and again, certifications are expensive. And if you're like spending already 40 lakhs on your education here in uh, America, so nobody expects you to do like $300 worth of certifications again. So, that is what, something. Do you think do you, do you think it helped your CV? Does it help your CV? The certifications. Uh, yes. So basically, what I did was uh, I actually trained for these certifications and I put them as training. So uh, I started to notice that my resume started getting picked up uh, like more in more numbers by these companies. It's it's the keywords that you put in the resume that like gets the attention. So uh, basically I, I did not do any certifications, but I, uh, I indicated that I have completed the training for those. Okay, so you completed training for the others. Yes. Okay, which ones would you do it? AWS is one for sure. Yes. But what about CKA? Uh, CKA and CKAD are good head starts. Uh, for someone who is coming from a development background, uh, I would suggest CKAD is like the easier one to start with uh, because it covers less uh, topics than CKA. Uh, And CKA is again, like for someone coming from a network or a hardware engineering or like someone who wants to get into the cloud engineering paradigm, CKA is amazing. CKA, I'm sorry. CKA. Um, The administrator exam, yes. Okay. Uh, The the other question is, do you think to become a cloud administrator, it's worth, I mean, what's the academic progression? Do you do an MS in computer science and then go to a cloud administrator or do you do a networking? uh, Uh, Yes. So what do you focus on? It's very, uh, it's very interesting. I I mean, it could go either way. Yeah. uh, So I would say uh, more of, uh, how should I put it? So basically my experience, like my uh, professional experience helped me more to get into cloud engineering than my academics. So uh, I basically what I did during my academics was a build up of what I did during my professional experience. So uh, yeah, I I think you have a question. No, I, I, so the question is going forward is uh, with respect to uh, the, uh, but do you suggest one to do an MS in general CS to move to a cloud administ- to, be- to become a cloud administrator or something to else? To become a cloud administrator, you would, so e- even if you're from a, uh, from CS background, you need infrastructure knowledge to get into cloud engineering. So uh, either take a mix of uh, infrastructure and software subjects 
uh, at, during your masters or during your undergrad uh, or gain experience in cs uh, do your uh, i mean gain professional experience in software development do your masters with a mix of uh, software development and infrastructure and then go for cloud engineering when you say infrastructure what do you mean and what type of courses would you recommend so, when it comes to infrastructure uh, so basically there are courses regarding cloud computing like with uh, wherein uh, they uh, wherein you have to do projects uh, basically developing projects on the cloud so that is one course that i took then there is big data and analytics uh, then i would say uh, okay at the top of my mind these are the two subjects but there are like a few others uh, yeah uh, there is a, a devops engineering course as well uh, so basically that covers your uh, that covers the entire uh, basics of devops engineering like how uh, software is developed how infrastructure is maintained so those are a few new and upcoming courses that are offered by universities and by nyu as well okay uh what about from a from a getting recruited perspective okay uh do you need to actually focus on did you focus on lead code how what is the interview process for you at deloitte or okay. uh sure so uh basically uh i uh, i did a lot of projects at nyu uh with respect to cloud uh, and i uh, also worked with uh, network virtualization uh so i did less of lead code i did more of hacker rank uh basically practicing and not like uh not the way lead code is i i just took my own time to practice like python and linux and bash programming uh then uh yeah that is one thing that i focused and i kept on doing uh, courses on udemy uh udemy is one thing that helped me a lot throughout because uh it it, it was uh, very uh, i would say the Kubernetes course uh, courses on Udemy are great. Uh, I did. I you, you actually get to do hands-on labs on that, so that is one advantage always uh, to remember. I did the courses last August, but I still remember how to work with Kubernetes. So, so would you say that uh, you did it? Did you do it concurrently with your masters these courses? Uh, so yes, I did. Uh, so uh, i did the courses on cloud native development like basically kubernetes and all those uh, kubernetes terraform ansible these different tools used uh, in cloud engineering i did that too, along with my masters you got it and uh, the question is uh, a question came up are the comchia courses worth it or should i start with aws directly uh i i don't have much uh, experience or knowledge with comptia i i have uh, trained for aws certifications and they are great like uh, organizations do look for people who are uh, aws certified aws or gcp uh, one thing i want to say is gcp also has something called quick labs uh, which you can do for free you can train like uh, you can actually learn about gcp through their own uh, learning website called quick labs Okay. Did you think your geo experience helped you to get into Deloitte? Yes, it did. Uh, so I am a part of the analytics and cognitive offering. So it's a mix of uh, cloud and machine learning. So uh, what I did back in geo was a mix of both. So I uh, I was working on uh, face recognition, then Kubernetes. Uh, istio which is more of a service mesh uh, on the cloud uh, so these all that experience and the projects that i did uh, as a part of geo did help me gave me uh, i would say gave me more depth more content to speak uh, with in interviews so uh, that that did help me a lot okay so now let's get to deloitte what was the let's yes. talk about it, deloitte what was the uh two questions before we move to deloitte nyu what is your best course at nyu that you would recommend people to take my best course would be the cloud computing course uh at nyu uh because we got to do projects on the cloud on aws uh and you in those 3 three, three and a half months you get to know how to how you can like formulate an entire project an entire project that can go 
live on the cloud that's so, awesome yeah that that was amazing i learned a lot from that okay so the the question uh, the the next question i want to ask you is what did how do you interview deloitte what is it the interview for a cloud engineer cloud role cloud analytics yes. role your role in at deloitte and what do you do currently at deloitte okay uh, so my interview experience was basically i uh, i was going through linkedin i was applying for jobs and deloitte was one of the jobs that i applied for through linkedin and uh, i got a call from the hr asking me whether i'm still available and whether i'm interested in this role uh, so my interview experience was basically three uh, one behavioral and two technical interviews uh, and the final interview was was with the senior uh, senior manager of the team uh, so it covered uh, so the behavioral interview basically covered uh, like behavioral questions uh, being a fresher they did not like being new to this uh, new to us uh, job uh, i would say environment they did not ask me much about like client service and they asked me more on behavioral questions uh, and so once that was done then two uh, technical rounds that involved uh, machine learning questions cloud engineering questions they asked me to uh, formulate uh, kubernetes yaml files like write uh, a deployment uh, maybe uh, a, a yaml file that describes the, this deployment which you would uh, actually do uh, in uh, as a part of your job so that was one thing and the final interview majorly involved uh, what my interests are and what my career progression is and what i'm interested in that's what they wanted to know in the final interview and what do you uh, currently do at deloitte once you got in deloitte what do you currently do oh so uh, currently so it's just my onboarding going on so it's just been two weeks so uh, now uh, i have my focus like the things that i have assigned that i've been assigned to is basically courses i have to do a lot of courses before before i am deployed on the project and one thing that like that actually help made me join deloitte and not try somewhere else is the focus that they give on uh, focus and op- opportunities that they give for doing uh, these courses uh, the certifications they enc- it is actually encouraged to do these things uh, during and after your office hours as well so that is something very interesting that that i found very interesting and uh, that is why i i focused on getting into deloitte great 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 what is your background in cs undergraduate background someone wants to know whether you came from what background as an undergraduate oh uh, so i came, i am not from i did electronics and telecommunications engineering so my focus was more on network engineering so then That's what i, I moved to yeah uh, i am not from a cs background i also did um, my masters was in computer engineering here at nyu yeah because this is incorrectly stated on my thing okay. okay so let me let me come back to let me ask you what would you tell now you've gone through this entire experience of getting yeah. going through your masters getting a job etc okay yeah. what would you tell the student community now in terms of we just getting out of covid what is okay. the market situation what do you do you recommend people to come there what is your frank opinion uh i would say frankly there are a lot of opportunities uh, i know uh, like a lot students struggled a lot like even my friends i know who struggled a lot during interviews uh but there are ample op- opportunities and there are opportunities that you want to go for it's not like you have to adjust on something uh, you have to do things that you don't want to do uh i would suggest that uh do your research majorly do your research uh, identify what you want to do uh, before coming to america because uh, on linkedin as well i got, get a lot of messages from people saying that they want to get into software engineering but they don't know in exactly what they want to do they just want to get into software engineering so do your research identify what you like and be open to exploring you i, I mean i still don't know exactly what i like 
uh, I, I am still open to exploring these different technologies. So I would suggest people to like not stick to one thing and go with it. Be open, keep learning and yeah, it's exciting to be here actually. So great, great, always great. aim for it. Great. Uh, I think you've answered all the questions if I'm not mistaken. Uh, thank you very much, Madhav, for being thank part of this. Thank you for having me. I, 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 I hope you're on the East Coast as opposed to the West Coast. <laughs> yeah, I'm on the East Coast. Good, good, good. I felt really yeah. bad that I woke up someone at 5.30 <laughs> in the morning to start off this whole thing. Yeah. So thank you very much for being part of thank this. Thank you. Okay. And we'll definitely be in touch. All right. Yes, it's good to hear from you. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. For the student community, we're going to have another session uh, in the coming week uh, that uh, we're going to have going forward. Uh, next week, we're going to have another, uh, next Saturday and Sunday, we're going to have uh, another uh, se- another few sessions, uh, another 17, I think another 10 to 12 uh, trailblazers who have become, who have made it successful there. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you next weekend on the same platform. Bye-bye.